I like, uh, you know, with reference to this, mm-hmm. how do we, you know, uh, go, you know, use, using this in the New Testament okay. relate to the Old Testament? Mm-hmm. Okay, so brother, I to buy, Okay, brother, can you do me a favor if you could no problem. ask the beginning part of your question again, please? I was saying that, you know, uh, just like yesterday, when we were reading at, uh, is it um, Genesis? No, no, no. Is it Genesis? Where uh, we were told about uh, the women periods and, you know, how if maybe you are in your period, don't do this, don't do that. You know what I mean? Eh? Now, I was trying to say that, is it not all in the law? So that you go back to Galatians and you compare what they are telling us in Galatians, that means we should not stick with the law, even though we are reading that. So what you're saying is that all these laws that was given to us by Moses, that according to Galatians, whoever follows it is, they're basically on their course. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, that's... Okay, can you give that advice again, please, Father Emmanuel? Galatians what? Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. Okay. Okay. So, let's go to... I, I will show you with... Paul is the one that wrote Galatians, right? Yes. Okay, great. Great. What you asked is a very good question. This is a very, very excellent question, which is, the law was given to us, but as we now have in the book of Galatians, it says that for all that follow the law, they're basically, they're on their course, basically, if you follow the law. Um, If we are to interpret what that place is saying in Galatians, right? Mm -hmm, Yeah. Yes. So now, Brother, can you go to Romans? Just please forgive me that I'm not going to I'm I'm not going to start speaking right away. I just want us to look at Galatians chapter I'm sorry, let's look at Romans chapter 7. Let's just read it and then and in that way I can lay foundation to what Paul was saying there. So let's go to Romans chapter 7. Uh I I do recommend reading this whole chapter later on when you have time. But right now, okay. let okay. us start um let's start from verse 14. okay this is the family seven 14 okay let me see this 14. for we know that the law is spiritual but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will do, I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. Should I continue? Yes, please. Okay. Okay. So if. Let me see this. So what it's saying Again, is that. See, I, what it's saying is that. Sometimes I do things I really don't want to do. Don't know, yeah. There are certain things I know I shouldn't be doing this, but I find myself doing it. And then the things that I know that I'm supposed to do, I don't do it sometimes. That's what he's saying. Okay, keep going. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so we are at, uh, let me see. Okay. If then I do what I will not do, I agree with the law that it is good but now it is no longer i who do it but sin that dwells in me for i know that in me that is in my flesh nothing good dwells for to will is present with me but how to perform what is good I do not find. Okay, hold on, okay. Sister okay, Aiden, we're hearing, I think we're hearing echo, Sister Aiden, if you can mute, so we don't hear echo. We're here, your mic is on, we're hearing echo. But, oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, okay. 
Okay. How do I mean my mic? One minute. Um, Lower right hand. Yeah, but um, like how you have your mute to this thing, I. I at, okay, at the, at the bottom, on the on the le yeah. on the right. Just touch okay. on touch on the microphone. Okay, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Okay, uh, it says for the good that I will do, I do not, I I do not do, but the evil I will not do, I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me. The one who wills to do good, for I delight in the law of God, according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Amen. 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 Now, let me ask you a question. Yes. Are you still looking at that chapter, Romans chapter 7? Yeah, I can go back. Roman, yes, I am there. Okay, Romans please 7. keep on looking at it. And everybody on stage, I'm about to show you guys something right now. Please take a look, a good look at that Romans chapter 7. Now, okay. look at verse 21. What does it say in verse 21? 21 is saying that I find them a law that evil is present with me. The one who wills to do good. Okay. okay. Now, look at verse 22. What does this say? For I delight in the law of God, according to the inward man. Okay. So we see that the, he said in verse 21, Romans 7, 21, I find a law. law. You go to verse 22. Oh, you go to verse 22. It says, for I delight in the law of God. Yes. Now look at verse 23. You're going to see another law. Look at verse 23. But I see another law, another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin. Okay. So we're seeing this, members. which is in my members, meaning in my body, which is in my members. Yes. Yes. Now look yes. at yes. Romans 7, 21 to 23. Mention law. Yeah. Mention law five times. Five times. Yeah. This is five different laws. Verse 21 says, For I, I find a law. You see, what I'm pointing out here is very significant because when Paul when Paul says that you're not under the law, the question is going to be which law is he talking about? Because as you can clearly see here, Paul is talking about multiple laws. Now, let's let explore a little bit just to confirm whether he's talking about just the law of God or is he talking about other laws too? In verse 21, starting from verse 14 that you read earlier, it says, yeah. it says for we know that the law is spiritual, but yes. I am carnal, sold on the yes. scene. Okay. Yes. Then you come down to verse 16. It says, if then I do that which I will not, I consent unto the law that it is good. So Paul is telling you that the law is not the problem. It's me. I am the problem. I am carnal. I am the, it's not the law. Because the law that says, don't steal. There's nothing wrong with that law. But I still convince myself why I should steal. I should, I still give myself reasons and override my conscience and go and steal. I still yeah. override my conscience and go and commit adultery. I still override my conscience and lie. 
Yeah. Okay, so what I the point I'm making here is to show you that Paul is talking about different laws. Yeah. We make a mistake by assuming. Okay, let me not go, go ahead of myself. Now, if you look at verse 23, it says, But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity, captivity. to the law of sin. So, as you can see, only in verse, just in verse 23 alone, there are three different laws. But I see another law in my body. Warring against the law of my mind. When you want to do certain things, your mind will tell you not to do it. If you go and do it, you're disobeying the law of your mind. Your conscience. If you want to do something bad, your conscience will always tell you, don't do it. This is not right. But then we have to make a choice. Do we want to obey our conscience or not? People that do bad things, they have developed the habit of overriding their conscience. Every single human being, like Paul said in Romans chapter 2, that God put his law, his law inside the heart of everybody, including those who don't even have the law. The, the Most High put the law in their heart. This is why when you go, in, when you go to China, and go inside deep, 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 deep village in the, in the middle of nowhere inside China. And you see people that have never seen civilization. In that place, they've never seen the law of God. They've never even heard about God. But the parents knows that it's not good to have sex with their children. They know it's not good to lie. They know it's not good to steal. Who told them these things that I already found in the Bible? Because that's what Paul was explaining to you in Romans chapter 2. Telling oh, yeah. you that God put his law in the heart of everybody. It comes, it comes standard as part that's of, in, in our heart. Everybody already knows whether they've read the Bible or not. They already know it's wrong, it's wrong to steal. It's, you know? So, what Paul is explaining to you here, when he says the law of my mind... That is that your conscience that tells you, don't do this, this is not right, or you should help this person. Things like that, your conscience is regulating you. So, Romans 7, 23 says, But I see another law in my, in my members, my body, warring against the law of my mind. There's a war going on. I see somebody, maybe somebody's wife, I start lusting after her. My conscience is telling me, move on. This is somebody's wife. My flesh is pushing me. No, this is going to be very good. Go ahead. It doesn't matter. We have one life to live. Enjoy yourself. Why? What are you doing? Do you even know who wrote that Bible? That Bible is a man-made book. Why can't you enjoy yourself? This is one life to live. This is what my flesh is pushing me. While my, my conscience is telling me, my mind is telling me, no, this is somebody's wife. This is not right. So there's a war going on. But for some people, they manage to overcome and rule over the, 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 the law of their flesh. The law, yes. Okay. And they, they don't disobey the law of their mind. That was what Paul was telling you in the beginning as you said the reading. He said that sometimes he wants to do something. Do, he knows that this is what he's supposed to do, but he doesn't do it. And then the one that he's supposed to do, you know, the one that he shouldn't do, he goes on to do. So Romans 7 here. Shows you that there are different types of laws. Now, the third law that was mentioned in Romans chapter 7, verse 23, verse 23. The third law is a law. It says, it says, let me read the whole verse. It says, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, conscience, and bringing me into the bringing me into captivity. Bringing me into captivity to the law of sin. Yeah. Which is in my members. That is when people dwell in dwell in sin. When let's say somebody is practicing homosexuality, you 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 you, you talk to them. You try to reason with them. They will tell you, "No, I'm born this way. I was born this way. I cannot stop. I, this is who I am." They they are now used to it. They are they, that person is in captivity. Oh. When somebody is always lying and lying and they can't stop lying, they are now in captivity. They are now in captivity, subjected to the law of sin. To the law of sin. Now, we go to verse 24. It says, O wretched man that I am, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me 
from the body of this dead. He says in verse 25, I thank God through Christ our Lord. So then, with, with, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So if I follow my flesh, I will be subjected to the law of sin. Whenever I have the urge to sin, if I'm following my flesh, if I'm always trying to, inter if it's just about me trying to fulfill my flesh, sometimes you just have to deny yourself certain things. Sometimes you have to deny yourself food in order to fast. Sometimes you might see somebody that you lost after. You, sometimes you're going to have to ignore that lost. Sometimes we have to force ourselves. But if we, if we cannot control ourselves, anything we see, if it smells good, we eat it. Even though it's pork or shrimp or whatever, or any or dog meat or cat meat, we eat. If we, if, when somebody is living like that, they're living after their flesh. They have no control. They're in captivity, subjected to the law of sin. So my brothers and sisters, what you can clearly see here, and if I say this, if I say this you can clearly see it. When you look at Romans chapter 7, Paul was talking about multiple laws multiple laws different types of laws okay let me before we leave this chapter can you go and read verse one take a look at verse one romans chapter 7 verse 1 this one okay okay we go. verse one free from the law oh do you not know brethren for i speak to those who know the law that the Lord has dominion over a man as long as he lives. Okay. Can you explain this verse 1 to me? What do you think it's talking about here? That means, the, 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 let me see, it says, Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law itself has dominion, over a man as long as he lives, which means we are in captivity, uh, or uh, we are captives to the law by itself, so that we have to be fighting it as we go on mm -mm. in life. First of all, what is dominion? Rule, or, you know, rule over us. Okay, so dominion, you're right, like domination, to dominate. Domination. Dominion. So, when something has dominion, like a king has dominion over his kingdom. Yes. This is telling you, Paul said that he is speaking to those that know the law. The people that he's speaking to also knows the law. So, they understand what he was saying. And then he said that a man, the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. That means that... As long as I am alive, I am under that law that says that I shall not steal. There's no, as long as I'm breathing, I am under that law. There will never be a time as long as I'm alive that I cannot be under that law that say, you see, all the laws that God gave, we are under those laws as long as we are alive. So that is what Paul is telling you here, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. Now, again, if you go down to the previous verses, if you go down, you now see Paul talking about different types of laws. In verse 14, he said that we know that the law is spiritual. For we know that the law is spiritual. In that verse 14, he's referring to the law of God. Romans 7, 14, when he said that we know that the law is spiritual, he is referring to the law of God. Now, if you look at uh, in verse 22, he is referring to the law of God. If you look at verse 23, he's talking about other laws. Those are not the laws of God. And, and most importantly, there is something called the law of sin. The law of sin. Now, let me, let, let me, let me show you where Paul got all this thing from. You see everything Paul was telling you here? Everything that Paul was saying in Romans chapter 7, let me show you where he got this from. Let's go to Genesis chapter seven, verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 7. Genesis. Genesis. 
Genesis 4. Verse 7. Okay. accepted and if you do not do well sin lies sin lies falling let me see oh, am i reading there yeah no no sin lies sorry let me begin again chapter 7 verse 7 says for if you do well will you not be accepted and if you do not do well sin lies at the door and its desire is for you but you should rule over it okay so what is going on here was uh it was a situation between cain and abel, cain and abel yeah. when cain and abel offered their offering the abel's cain was accepted um cain's offering was not accepted so he became angry he was not happy and this is what the most high told cain he said that if you do well will you if you do well you will be accepted if you don't do well it says that sin lies at your door sin lies at your door and it's desire so this the, the, the desire of sin is to rule over you over it yeah this is what the most high was telling this man just think the, the, there is something to this particular statement that the Most High made. The Most High, our Creator, is telling Cain that if he doesn't do well, sin is at the door, his door. And the desire of sin is to rule over, over. him. Now, if you go back to Romans chapter 7, you see that Paul was talking about the law of sin. That we are not supposed to be under the law of sin. So if you go to chapter, uh, verse 1, it says that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. So we are supposed to be under the law of God. We're supposed to, the law of God is supposed to have dominion over us, not the law of sin. So sin will always knock on our door on a daily basis. It is up to us to rule over it. If we live in the flesh, we will not be able to overcome and rule over it. If we live according to the Spirit, as you can see in the next chapter, when you get a chance, please, you read, okay. when you get a chance, you know, you can read uh, Romans chapter 8. You now see Paul breaking it down again about how though the people that can, when people live under the flesh, they cannot obey God. Those that live in the Spirit, they, can, they will be able to obey God. So the point I'm trying to make is that the first question you asked me, was do we still have to keep all these laws that god that was given to us through moses like the law yes. that talked about a woman's in when she sees a monthly period yeah, yeah, what yeah, she's supposed yeah. to do and things like that do we really have to keep that law when we clearly have in the book of galatian where it mm -hmm. says that if you live under the law you are cursed. You are cursed. If you live under the law, you are cursed. So, now no. that we no. come to Romans chapter 7, mm -hmm. and we read this, mm -hmm. the question I would like to ask you or anybody on stage is this. With the understanding that you have right now, as it relates to Romans chapter 7, now that you know that Paul talked about multiple laws, different types of laws, which law do you think he's referring to in Galatians? The law of God. Am I on speaker? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Yes, you're, you're on speaker. So, so, Paul, in Galatians, when he says that when you keep the law, you are under a cause. So you're saying that Paul is saying that the law he's referring to there is the law of God? No. No, no. That's the law of sin. 
Okay, because I'm a little bit confused. You said the law of God initially. We are still under the law of God that says, do not steal, do not cause adultery. Because we are still practicing that in that system. You know when you do that, system. and it's a law that is a part of the law that Moses brought. So okay. we are still under that law. Okay, so if we, we go to Galatians... Because the grace has come, so we can steal now because I'm under the grace. So I will steal, I will do whatever I like. No, I can't do that. Okay. I know, yeah, that's what I mean. All right, so... The scripture, the place in question right now is the book of Galatians. That was what the brother asked. Because in Galatians, it says that if you follow the law, you will be under a curse. You are on, for as many as follow the law are under a curse. So the question is, is if you read that Galatians right there, if you only read that Galatians, of course, it says the law. But if you go and look at Romans chapter 7 and see yeah, what Paul... Where, where Paul went into details about the law. Now you can clearly see that in Galatians, he's not talking about the law, about the law of God, I'm sorry. He's not referring to God's law because he tells you multiple times in Romans chapter 7. He tells you in verse 14 that the law of God is spiritual. He tells you in that Romans chapter 7 that the problem is not the law of God. The problem is me, us. We are the problem uh, because we tend to obey our flesh over the, following the spirit and then he goes on to tell you that he delights in the law of god and that he himself served the law of god and then but so if you look at romans 7 you can clearly see that paul is talking about different laws the problem that we have is this my brothers and sisters here's the problem the problem we have is that we have a situation where uh people will just open the Bible and go to that Romans, uh, go to Galatians and read it all the places where it says we are not under the law. They will just read it and they will just go on to preach. And then, but the thing is that Paul's, each time you see Paul tell you that you're not under the law, Paul is referring to the law of sin. There's something, there's something called the law of sin. And Paul tells you about that thing multiple times. And even the Most High confirmed it in uh, Genesis 4, 7. The Most High confirmed that there is something called the law of sin, called sin, and sin will knock at your door. And it's, it's up to you. It is you are required to override it. Exactly. You're required to rule over it. Let me tell you something. There are plenty of things I was doing in the past there are plenty plenty of things that i was doing that i will never do again i will never do these things again in the past i was like i was do i would lie to you i i lied a lot i lied and i lied nicely i did a lot of things that was i wasn't supposed to be doing in the past and that means, like he says, I was in sub, I was actually in captivity without even realizing it. Like I give you an example with a homosexual. A homosexual is under captivity, under the law of sin. We're not supposed to be under the law of sin. We're supposed to be under the law of God. So with all this, when you look at this whole thing, my brothers and sisters, Paul was not speaking against God's law. He was not. When Paul tells you that we are not under the law, he's referring to the law of of sin because if you go to romans 2 13 brother can you read romans 2 13 and let's see what paul says about the law in romans 2 13. Romans 2. Oh, come on no take your time take your time Sorry. For not the hearers 
of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. So this yeah. room, this yeah. Romans chapter two, right here, brother. Can you go yeah. to chapter three? Go over to chapter three. You see this. Uh, one minute, uh, please, Sister Evelyn. Can you please mute your phone? Mute it. Uh, mute your phone. Me. Yeah, there's echo. I'm not hearing you. I'm using Bluetooth. Oh, the mute. The mute button is on the side. Sister Evan, you have you as the mother ready, you can add uh, two two if she's unable to find it. No, but so so as you're going to chapter three, as I was saying, Romans chapter okay. Romans chapter. Which verse did you say? Yeah, I'll, I'll give you the verse. Go down towards uh, towards the let's. Hello. Oh, sorry, my mic was muted. Um, oh, okay. Sorry, I was speaking Wait, while my mic was muted. Yeah, we're going to start okay. from verse twenty-seven. Okay, but hold on. Okay, 3 verse 27. Yes, we're going to start from there, but, but hold on. So the one that okay. you read, what you read in Romans 2.13, the whole chapter of Romans chapter 2 is talking about the judgment day. If you read from verse 1, Paul was talking about the judgment day. And if you go down to verse, verse 13, Paul said that not the hearers of the law are just, but the doers of the law will be justified. So that was what he's referring to in verse 13, that not just those who hear the law will be justified, but those who do the law, those who keep the law. So why am I putting this? Why am I saying this? Because Paul spoke about multiple laws. He also referred to the law of God. So he's telling you, Paul is telling you that on the judgment day, that the people who will be justified are those who did God's law, those who kept God's law. Now, let's go over to chapter 3 from verse 27. Now, please, my brothers and sisters, listen closely to this, because let me just say this before the brother read it, so you, can, you guys can understand where we are. So the brother asked a question, a very legitimate question. He said, why should we be keeping those laws in Leviticus, like the law that talked about a woman seeing her monthly period and stuff like that? Why should we be keeping those laws when you go to Galatians? Galatians says that for uh, as for those who follow the law, that they are under a sin, under a curse. That people that keep the law are under a curse. Why should we be keeping those laws when those that keep the laws are under a curse? That was the question that the brother asked. So I'm showing, I'm showing from the words of Paul, the same Paul that wrote Galatians. I am showing from his own word that Paul spoke about different types of laws. So each time Paul tells you that you're not under the law, you need to find out the law that he's referring to. Because he ref he spoke about the law of sin. He spoke about the law of his mind, the law of flesh, and then the law of God. So there are different types of laws, as we're about to see right now. Now, let's see. He's going to even talk about even more laws in Romans chapter 3. Let's start from verse 27 all the way down. Okay. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith, apart from the deeds of the law. Or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not only the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith, and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. Okay, so we can clearly see here, uh, Paul was referring to something he called as the law of faith. The law of faith. And then he goes on to give you a little bit more detail. If you remember, you know, Peter said that writings of Paul is hard to understand. Peter said that. Yeah. Even at that yeah. time, even almost 2,000 years ago, 
Paul's writing was difficult to understand. So that was why I showed you Genesis chapter 4, verse 7. So that, you, so that you can see where Paul was getting his information from. Paul was not just speaking out of his own mind. He was speaking because he knew the law. Paul knew the law very well. So as you see here in Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 3, he tells you that after saying all this, in verse 31, he says, Do we then make void the law? When you make void of something, that is to, to cancel something, to annul it, do we then make void the law through faith? He said, God forbid, yea, we establish the law. So what he's simply telling you here, and in order for you to understand what Paul was saying here, it's also important for us to understand the time that he was speaking. Because most people at this time, most, of, most people were keeping the law. Most of these people were born and raised in the law. I can give you a couple of examples. When they show, when, when in, in Acts chapter 10, when they showed uh, Peter a bunch of food, animal to eat, Peter said that I have never eaten unclean food in my life. I have never in my life ever eaten unclean food. And then you go to Matthew 19, Matthew 19, 16 and 17. When that man asked Christ for salvation, Good master, what can I do to have eternal life? Christ said, "Stop! Call, don't call me good. I am not good. There's only one who is good, who is in heaven. But if you want to have eternal life, keep the commandment. Uh, the man said, I have kept the commandment from my youth. The point I'm making is that the people at that time, most of them was keeping God's law. The problem that they had is not the same problem that we have today. Our problem today is the opposite. Back then, they were keeping the law, but they didn't have faith. Today, we have faith, but we're not keeping the law. Because we, we were not born in the law. Most of us was born, we didn't even know about the keeping God's law. Back then, it was the opposite back then. Okay? So they had a different mindset. So Paul was speaking, the way that Paul was speaking to them, you can't take that and apply to us. Because today... Almost everybody that you meet today will tell you, yes, I believe in Christ. Back then, it wasn't so. Back then, they got the prophecy. They have Isaiah 53. But it was, it, Christ was within their midst, and they couldn't believe it. Why? Because they, know, they knew his earthly father. They knew his, his mother. They knew his brothers. So it was hard for them to believe that Christ was the, the anointed one. Okay, so the problem that these people have in the first century is not the same problem that we have today. It's actually very dangerous to take the gospel that was preached to them and preach to us because they and us are not the same. Again, we don't have problem with faith that much. Most of us believe in Christ. Most of us would never deny Christ, not even Muslims. Muslims will tell you, yes, I, I, I believe that Christ existed. So you, it's, it's very important for you to keep in mind it, this particular point in order to understand what Paul was saying. So Paul was dealing with people that was already keeping the law. All of these people were keeping God's law. They were born under that system. Everybody was keeping the law. But the problem that they had was because a lot of them was alive when Christ was born. A lot of them grew up with Christ. It was extremely difficult for them to accept that Christ was the Messiah. So Paul had to preach in this manner. He had to preach in this manner, in this way, which is the reason why when they didn't listen to him, Christ appeared to him at night and told him to leave. Get away from Jerusalem. Leave because they're not listening. They refused to listen to Paul. So he left, uh, left Jerusalem to go and preach in other places. So again, keep in mind, that gospel, that was, the message that was preached to them back then, that cannot apply to us today. Because they and we today, most of us don't keep the God's law. Most of us do not keep God's law. Back then, most of them was keeping God's law. But they didn't have faith. So it's like yeah. vice versa. So today we have faith, but we don't keep God's law. And Paul is telling you in Romans chapter 3, as you can clearly see from verse 27, that you have to mix the two. You have to mix the two. It's not, you can't just, you can't just only keep the law and not believe in Christ. You're still going to go to hell because if you only keep the law and you, you don't believe in Christ, 
then you're going against Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15 to 19. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15 to 19. The Most High told us ahead of time that he was going to send somebody. The Most High said that he would send somebody to come. So Christ came and did exactly what he was supposed to do. As he says in, uh, in Matthew 9, 13. Matthew 9, 13, I did not come for the... I didn't come for the righteous, but I came to bring sinners to repentance. So you have to understand that the audience that Paul had back then is different from us. So that was why he made it very clear in Romans chapter 3 from verse 27 that it's not just uh, having faith. We cannot make void the law because of faith. And I'm going to close by this, by saying this. Even Christ, even when you go to Revelation, the book of Revelation, chapter 14 and chapter 12. You see, chapter 12 talked about those that have their faith in Christ and keep the commandment. Those that keep the commandment and have their faith in Christ. That's in chapter 14. Satan will go after those people. Those that keep the commandment of God and have their faith in Christ. And then you go to chapter 14, Rome, uh, Revel Revelation chapter 14. It talked, it talked about those who will overcome the beast that they keep the commandment and have the testimony of Christ. You see, it goes hand in hand. So what we have today in this world, the, the, the sad thing we have, the sad situation we have today in the world is that we now focus 100% on faith without keeping the law. But Paul is teaching you in Romans chapter 3 that the whole point that Paul was making is that this is not just about having faith. You have to also keep the law. You cannot just have faith and then make void the law. Like when you write somebody a check and then you cancel the check, you're making void that check. We can't make void the laws of God because of faith. It works hand in hand. And then this is also confirmed in Revelation chapter 12 and Revelation chapter 14 also, where it says that it talked about those that keep the commandment of God and have their faith in Christ. So now you understand like as I said, it's very dangerous to go and take the message that Paul was preaching to these people in the first century. Their situation is different from our situation. So does that make sense now, my brothers and sisters? Oh, yes, 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 definitely. But now... Okay, so, uh, Sister yeah. Brother Emmanuel. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's let somebody else also to ask question. Okay, okay. okay so um, Sir Iram, you are welcome. Sir Iram, you are welcome. Thank you. Thank uh, okay. So, um, if you ha do you have any question or you want to add something to uh, what is being discussed? No, no, any questions? I'm just listening. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Does anyone else has any more? Qu any other question? If you if you don't mind me, just asking one quick question. Okay, all right. But I'm not like, uh, in conclusion, I, 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 I'm just trying to, I, I'm just, I have understood that majority of the virtues, every single virtue that God has given to us, such as faith, love, charity, every single one is a law. So therefore, it is entirely up to us individuals to define which one which type of law it is so that you can run away from it such as faith is it a law of sin love is it a law law of sin charity is it a law of sin you know so that when the situation occurs for us to uh, define or to find out what type of law it is to run away from it am i okay Yes, I understand what you're asking. Um, it was never, 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 never designed for us to individually decide the law that we should keep. It was never like that. Because it says in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, that our heart is deceitful. Our heart is wicked. So there are people today who are stealing, uh, at least in my part of the world, uh, I do have my brothers, the Igbos, who will get on the highway they will take a gun step out on the highway 
They will rob people, kidnap people, steal their car. And in their mind, they have some kind of self-justification for doing this. I even have my own brothers, Igbos, who are killing other Igbos for various reasons. Because to them, the, the reason why they're doing it, the, 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 the end, like they, they have a, 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 for them, killing a couple of their brothers and sisters to achieve that greater goal is not that bad. So this is what happens when people follow their heart. Okay, so it was never, never the will of the Most High for us to decide which part of his which part of his word we should obey it was never like that so what i just told you right now i'm going to have to prove it let me let me prove to you that we're not allowed to choose which one is valid and which one is not so let's go to matthew 23 verse 1 to 3 Matthew 23, verse 1 to 3. Okay. Matthew 23, verse 1. Would somebody else read too? Oh. Matthew 23, yeah. Matthew 23, 1, verse 1. Hello? Yes, verse 1 to 3. Yes, please. Okay. Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do according to their works. For they say, and do not do. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders. Okay. But they themselves will not move move them okay. with one of their uh, fingers. All right. So now, let's start from that verse 1. What do you think Christ was... Who, who was Christ speaking to here? He was speaking to his disciples. Okay. Uh, if somebody can help me to read this also in New Living Translation, and just another translation, just to get a second opinion in terms of translation. But here, he's speaking to the multitude and his disciples. And he tells them something very important. So I'm just trying to see, for those of you, my brothers and sisters who are on stage, if you're down downstage, you can, you can come up also. Feel free to come up. My question is, what is Christ telling his followers here it's very very significant very important for us to understand what he's what he's telling his followers but i would like to for, for you to hear what you think christ was telling his followers in matthew 23 verse 1 to 3 what do you think christ was telling his followers he actually told them remember that he's talking about the pharisees the same people that he was cursing out the same people that he was calling vipers, calling children of Satan. He, ne he then turned around and then gave an instruction to his own followers regarding the Pharisees. So my question is, what do you think Christ was telling his followers here? Yeah, to, to listen to the Pharisees that, that teach them to keep the law. Okay. Can somebody? Well, I think, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So to me, uh, it looks like he's telling them not to be like them because they say and and not and they don't do. So they are they just you know speak the law but they don't follow it. Okay. Can somebody pull it up in New Living Translation? If you can Google it, just Google Matthew twenty three and put NLT next to it. Type into your phone. Matthew 23, and then you put NLT, N like Nancy, NLT. I, I just want you to hear that translation, the way it reads there. Uh, 
That's the reason why I'm showing you this. Because this explains a lot of things. And if, you, if you're really approaching the Most High with all your heart, if you're really being honest with the Most High, then you really have to meditate in this Matthew 23. You really have to really think within yourself. Why would Christ make a statement like this? Because if you... Okay. Yeah, go I, ahead. Matthew 23, in the, uh, from verse 1 to 3, in the New Living Translation. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to use Yesu for Jesus. That's just my personal preference, and it's in my language. Then Yesu said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, are the official interpreters of the law of Moses. So practice and obey whatever they tell you, but don't follow their example, for they don't practice what they teach. Okay, okay, so, so now let me ask you again, what instructions was Christ giving his followers? To, to practice and obey the law. Which, which law? What the law. what they are teaching the law the law of God. Okay. The laws of Moses. The laws of Moses. All right. Yeah. Okay. So, if you look at John chapter sixteen and John chapter seventeen, Christ spoke a lot there, and he even prayed. Christ prayed. He prayed not just for his disciples, but he also prayed for those who will come in the future. Christ said that he wasn't praying for the world, but he only prayed for those. Brother, we're hearing some, some background from you, Brother uh, Emmanuel. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah. So Christ said that he wasn't just praying for the world. He's praying for those who will follow him those who are following him and those who will come in the future there's a reason why i'm saying this uh that's uh john chapter 17 verse 9 john 17 9 i pray not i pray for them i pray not for the world but for them which thou has given me for they are for they are mine now as you read paul or uh, christ also goes on to Talk about those who will come in the future. That whatever he's, the prayer that he's praying right now should also cover those who will come in the future. So whatever instruction Christ gave to his disciples also applies to you. If you say you believe in Christ, if you say that you believe in Christ, then whatever, or Yeshua, Yeshua, Whatever instruction he gave to his disciples also applies to you and applied to me. So if you if if these instructions apply to us, then you can clearly see that Christ was teaching his followers, multitude that was listening to him and his disciples, that they should follow. They should follow the laws of Moses because the Pharisees were the, or the official interpreters. So this changes everything. What Christ says here in Matthew 23 destroys everything we've been taught, my brothers and sisters. Everything we've been taught in the church from the time we were born. Because think about it. This is the same Christ that was cursing out the Pharisees. Christ and the Pharisees did not see eye to eye, eye to eye. If you continue reading in that chapter, Matthew 23, if you continue reading, Christ, you know this. Everybody knows that Christ did not see eye to eye with the Pharisees. He kept calling them hypocrites. So after calling them all these names, Christ still told his own followers to do whatever the Pharisees are teaching them from the laws of Moses. He said that, they are the official interpreters of the law of Moses. This is instruction that Christ was giving his followers. So if you do not listen to the Pharisees, you are disobeying Christ. If you do not follow the laws of Moses that the Pharisees was teaching, you are disobeying Christ. Now, if we 
if I now quote Matthew 7, 21 to 23, it all begins to make sense. You see, this is the reason why that Christ made the statement that we'll all of us know about, that statement. He says in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will be allowed into the kingdom, but those that did the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we cast out demons in your name. We healed the sick in your name. We did miracles in your name. And I will, I will tell them, get away from me. My sister, Sister Siram, can you go to Matthew 7 and then look it up again from New Living Translation? You can look it up for any other translation, but just look up. Okay, let me tell you what it says in New Living Translation. In KJV, King James Version, Matthew 7, 23 says, Get away from me, I don't know you. You who walked iniquity. You workers of iniquity. That is what it says in King James Version. In the New King James Version, it says, Get away from me, I don't know you. You who practiced lawlessness. In the New Living Translation, it says, Get away from me, I don't know you. You who broke God's law. He says that when he comes back, Matthew 7, 21 to 23, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will be allowed into the kingdom, but those that did the will of my father. Now, if you look at the world today, who is casting out demons in Jesus' name? Is it the Muslims? Is it the Hindus? Is it the atheists? Who is healing the sick in Jesus' name? Who, who do you think is going to be running and, and shouting and screaming and laughing and coming towards Christ on that day and saying, we cast out demons in your name? When you turn on your TBN, when you watch your, TV, your Christian television station, who is, is it the Muslims who are casting out demons in Jesus' name? This is a prophecy that Christ was giving you, telling you what will happen in the future. All these people who are doing miracle right now, which is mainly Christianity, is telling you that not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will be allowed into the kingdom. But those that did the will of my father. Where do you find the will of his father? Where do you find the will of God? You don't find the will of God in Galatians. That's just a reality. The book of Galatians was a, was a letter lit, written to those in Galatia. There was a congregation in a city called Galatia. You can Google it. Type into Google. Galatia. It was a letter written to them, a letter of encouragement. That is not the word of God right there. And as a matter of fact, oh my goodness, Paul will never allow anybody to put his letters next to the word of God. Paul will never do that. I'm telling you, if Paul was around when they were trying to put his letters next to the laws of God, Paul will fight. Paul will, Paul will physically fight that person. Because Paul knows how holy the law of God is. My brothers and sisters, the Bible you're holding today was arranged. It was not written by the white man. As some people will say, no, the white man did not write the Bible. But you, there's, there's something you need to realize, my brothers and sisters. Back then, the scriptures was on scroll. A scroll. You can Google and look at the picture of a scroll to see what a scroll looks like. All these scriptures was on scroll. So if you want to read the book of Isaiah, you go and get the scroll of Isaiah. And back then, people did not have the laws of God in their house. The scripture is in the temple. If you want to learn the scripture, you go to the temple. That is the way it used to be. So that was why our ancestors spent a lot of time every day in the temple. As you see in Luke 21, the very last verse in Luke 21. At the end of Luke 21, you see that people were going to the temple every day to go and learn the law. But what happened was that in 70 AD, this is the truth. My brothers and sisters, please, I, I forgot to tell you. When I began to speak, I should have told you to have a pen. Get a pen because I'm going to give you some information I would like you to look up. Look it up. If you do not see it, next time you see me on Clubhouse, I would like you to come on stage and tell everybody that I am a liar. Tell everybody that I am a liar and I'm lying with the word of God. I'm going to give you some information right now. Go and look it up. Use your phone and Google it and look it up. If you do not see it, 
I would like you to come back next time I'm on stage. Please come and expose me. The first information, the first information I'm going to give you is the Arch of Titus. There's something called the Arch of Titus. Just Google it. I'm going to spell it. A R C H of Titus. I'm trying to tell you how the Bible was arranged. It was not the will of the, well. Yeah, of course, it's the will of God. But it was not our ancestors that put it together the way we have it right now. Initially, it was 86 books initially. These decisions was being made by the Gentiles. So it was them that decided to put these epistles. In a modern day terms, all this book of Timothy. Book of Timothy was written to, was written to, to Timothy, an individual. So... The point I'm making, let me finish up with the title, Arch of Titus 10. I would like you to Google Arch of Titus. That is something that the, a monument that the Roman Empire built in ninth, around 90 AD. The Roman Empire built this thing after they destroyed Jerusalem. They destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD. And after the destruction of Jerusalem, they went back to Europe. They went back to Europe and build something called the Arch of Titus. My brothers and sisters, the Arch of Titus is still standing today in Europe. That thing is almost 2,000 years old. That thing was built after the Roman Empire destroyed Jerusalem. So why am I talking about Arch of Titus? If you go, if you, if you put Arch of Titus on, on YouTube, look at those videos. You will see a video from BBC. BBC was allowed to take their camera and to come very close to the Arch of Titus to, 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 to video what was the picture that was engraved in the Arch of Titus. What you see in what they, the picture of what they put in the Arch of Titus was Manora. Manora is found in our temple. The Most High told us to make it. So all the stuff that they looted, all the stuff that they stole from Jerusalem, they, they engraved the pictures in, the, in that Arch of Titus. This is how they got their hands on the Bible in 70 AD. Because our ancestors were running for their life. Our ancestors, even Christ predicted this. Christ prophesied this in Luke 21. When Christ was still on earth, Christ prophesied, Yeshua HaMashiach, our Savior, prophesied how the Gentiles will invade the land. How the Israelites will be scattered in the four corners of the earth. How the Gentiles will tremble on that land until the times of the Gentiles is fulfilled. So, 30 something years after Christ, this happened in 70 AD. You can also Google, Google the Roman invasion of Jerusalem. That was when the real Israelite was driven out of Jerusalem in 70 AD. So, because the temple, because the scriptures, the scriptures is usually kept in the temple. The only person that gets to have a scripture in his house is the king, according to the law in Deuteronomy 17. The Most High said that the king is the only one that's supposed to get a copy of the law. The law is supposed to be kept in the temple. Anybody who wants to learn the law, they go to the temple, and the Levites will teach them. That is the way it used to be. So it was after our enemies destroyed the, 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 the Roman Empire, destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD. And the Israelites, the ones who survived, migrated into Africa and went and settled. The Roman Empire took over the land. That was why they went back to Europe and built the Arch of Titus and then put the pictures of what they stole in the temple. Just like the Babylonians. The Babylonians did the same thing earlier. The Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and they took a bunch of stuff from Jerusalem and moved it back to Babylon, if you remember. Okay, so that was how they got the Bible. So I want you to understand that the Bible you're holding today was not written by the white man. The Bible was written by Israelite. Israelite wrote the Bible. But the Bible fell into the hands of the enemy. The scriptures fell into the hands of the enemy in 70 AD. Because that, that, that the Most High actually did this. The Most High did this. What I'm talking about, the Most High did it. So let me just show you where he said that he would do it before he did it. Before we continue. I know if you want to ask questions, I know a lot might be on your mind. So I'm going to try to stop right now. I want to show you because here's the thing. When I say these things, I like to prove it. So let me show you because I want you to know that Jerusalem was not destroyed because 
the God of the Israelites, was powerless. Jerusalem was not destroyed because the God of the Israelites was powerless. No. Before it was destroyed, it was prophesied that it would be destroyed. So, that's found in Lamentations chapter 2, verse 1 to 6. If, if somebody can read it. Lamentations 2, 1 to 6. So you can see how the heathen got the Bible. So when they now take the scriptures, the true word of God, and then they take a bunch of epistles. Look, I love writings of Paul. I understand what Paul is saying. Sometimes people will call me. People will be against Paul. No, I'm not against Paul. Paul did not speak against the law. I understand where Paul was coming from. I, I understand what he's writing. That was why I reminded you earlier on. For you to keep in mind that the writings of Paul, you cannot take the writings of Paul and apply to us today because he was speaking to those who were keeping the law, but they didn't have faith. So the audience, people that he was, the Israelite that Paul dealt with, those Israelites was keeping the law. And I showed you the evidence with, in, in Matthew chapter 19. So what I would like to do is, if somebody can read Lamentations, chapter 2, verse 1 to 6, because I want you to know that the hidden, the Roman Empire, did not overpower Jerusalem and destroyed it, just like the transatlantic trans slave trade. All of us know about the transatlantic trans slave trade. And up until today, as I speak, there are so-called Africans, there are our people who cannot understand why our ancestors did not fight the Europeans. How could we have folded our hand and watch these people come into our land and colonize us and took our people as slaves? How could they have done this? There are people that still have that question. But what I'm trying to tell you, my brothers and sisters, you see, when I speak about these things, I like to give an example with the wind, the air. All of us are breathing. We breathe. All of us have seen a tree, have seen a tree moving. As I'm talking to you, I can see a, a tree shaking right now. The, 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 the leaves on the tree is moving. That is what the wind does. So we can see a flag flying. We can see the tree shaking. But none of us have ever seen the air, the wind. No eyes has ever seen the wind. Without the air, we will all die. So we can feel the air. You can put your hand in front of an air condition. You can put your, like we can feel it, but we cannot see it. God is like that. John 4.24. John 4.24. He said that God is a spirit. So just like, so you can see what the, for example, tornado. If you've seen those videos, or if you've had experience of where a tornado will, will, will visit, when a tornado comes to town, it destroys everything on, on its path. It's a wind, but you cannot see that wind. So what I'm telling you is that that, transatlantic slave trade colonial, colonial colonialism when the gentiles the europeans came into africa and colonized what you are watching or what our ancestor was watching was it's like you watching a house being destroyed by a tornado or you watching a tree shaking moving around by a wind you can see the action. You can see the reaction, but you cannot see what is pushing it. So I'm telling you that it was the Most High that empowered the Roman Empire to destroy Jerusalem in 70 AD. It was the Most High that empowered their descendant who came in, the British, their descendant to come in in the 1600s and to colonize us and to take our people as slaves. Even till this, till today, till today, what Africa has is a fake freedom, because to, till this, to, till this moment, Africa is still under the control of the Europeans. Till this today, that is why no president will go against them. Any president that go against them will go down like Gaddafi, will go down like Gaddafi, and also like the the president of Haiti that they killed recently. So the point I'm making to you, going back to the Bible, is that. You need to keep certain things in mind and you need to like understand that when you pick up your Bible, that's not the way it was originally meant to be. The word of God, going back to the words of Christ, Christ said in Matthew 7, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will be allowed into the kingdom, 
but those that did the will of my father who is in heaven. So the question is, why do you, where do you find the will of God? You can't find the will of God in, in, in Romans. You can't find the will of God in Galatians or Titus or uh, Ephesians. Okay, that's not where you find the will of God. The will of God that Christ is referring to is in Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Numbers, Exodus. How do we know? Because I showed you Matthew 23. You read Matthew 23, where Christ was telling his followers to obey every single thing in the law of Moses that the Pharisees was teaching. So again, if you go against the laws of Moses, you are 100% going against the Christ because it was the instruction from Christ. Christ instructed his followers, not just those who were there. As you can see in John chapter 16 and John chapter 17, Christ was not just talking about those who were there. Christ was also referring to those that will come in the future. That means you and I. So the instruction from Christ is that we should follow all the laws of Moses, as you can see in Matthew 23 from verse 1 to 3. So this goes, this completely destroys everything we've been taught. Oh, we're not under the law. I've already addressed the issue of not being under the law. I showed you from Romans chapter 7 that Paul was not talking about God's law. And I think we, at the end of the day, after I showed you that, we all agreed to that. What I'm showing you again now is that there's a clear instruction from Christ, complete clear instruction that we are to follow the laws of Moses. This is why he said that when he comes back, people will come to him saying that they cast out demons in his name. They did miracles in his name and he will reject them because they did not keep God's law. That is verse 23. Matthew 7 23 it's very clear so if you say that you love Christ if you say you love Christ then you have to keep the laws of Moses because Christ said so and that is why I keep the law of Moses because that is an instruction from Christ from 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 Christ so but this of course is not what we've been taught in Christianity which by the way Christianity was not created by Christ Christ did not create Christianity not even the apostles did and I can prove it to you from the Bible. So, my brothers and sisters, the Bible says one thing. The doctrines, the doctrines we've been taught is different. Like, for example, we do wedding in the church. Show me anywhere from Genesis to Revelation, where people went to the church to do wedding. And give me your PayPal. I will send you $50. I'm not going to say $5,000. i am going to tell you what I can do. Send me your email and I will send you. If you can show me a verse, a verse in the Bible where people went to church and did their wedding the way we do it today, you're not going to find it. You will not find it because wedding is not done in the church. And that thing is baptizing babies. You see how they deceived us, how they tricked us into answering their names. Almost every African you meet today has three names. Three names, especially those of us from Western Africa. Those in the Muslim area, in the North, North Africa, it might not be so much. But those of us from the Western Africa, almost all of us have English name. We have three names. We have our, our, our first name. We have our so-called, quote-unquote, baptismal name. That baptismal name thing is a nonsense. It's not biblical. This is how the Europeans have tricked us into answering their name, by making it look like it's biblical. So when, it, when you give birth to a child, when you give birth to a child, they say, oh, you have to, you have to baptize your child. And then what, what name do you get? What name do you give to your child? Uh, John, Lillian, Elizabeth, Jackson, all these names. These are not biblical name. Matthew is not a biblical name. His real name is Matityahu. John is not a biblical name. His real name is Yahonan, and so on and so forth. So this is how we've been tricked i'm telling you things things that we've been taught in christianity that look like it's from the bible but it's not one of them being the name because you belong to whoever you answer the, their name whoever you answer their name is who you belong to like wh whoever's name you answer is who you belong to that is why the most high said in second chronicles 7 14 second chronicles 7 14 if my people who are called by my name 
if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, I will listen from heaven and heal their land. So that, that's why you have Jeremiah, Isaiah, Hezekiah, Nehemiah, Hosea. And then we say hallelujah, which means praise Yah or praise God, right? So God's people always have their name in their name. God's people always have God's name in their name, right? Now, when, when the Babylonians took Israelites as slaves, if you look at Daniel chapter 1, one of the first things that the Babylonians did was to change the names of these Hebrew people. One of the first things that they did was to change their name. Okay? It's the same thing that the Gentiles have done. The Europeans, when they came into Africa, they lied to us and they tricked us. They were holding Bible. They were literally holding Bible. And then used it to deceive us and trick us into answering their name. So today we, we answer John, um, uh, Mary, uh, all these names. Okay. But if you actually go in the Bible, can you show me a chapter and verse where they were baptizing babies? You can go to Luke chapter 3. That is where you see John baptizing people. John baptizing people. You see, ba baptism is not for babies. If you actually understand what baptism is all about, it's not for babies. You see, anybody can go and get wet. People go to the stream, like all of those of us that grew up in a village. We were going to stream and we, and, and, and we, and we, and we swim. Does that mean that we were baptized? My point is that just because water was poured on you doesn't mean that you are not baptized. There's a lot much more meaning behind baptism. If you look at Luke chapter, Luke chapter 3, people came to John the Baptist to get baptized. Do you know that he did not baptize a lot, most of these people? He did not because there's a requirement. He required them that they have to do something. When they asked him, what do we need to do? He, he, now, he now began to tell them what to do, what they have to do. So my point being that when you look at the Bible, when you look at the Bible, you see that baptism was for adults. Okay? It was for adults because somebody has to decide for themselves if they want to get baptized. But before they can get baptized, they have to repent first. They have to repent from breaking God's law and then get baptized. But when these people came into Africa, right? When they came in, they now tricked us into receiving their name and then they call it baptismal name but that's actually us answering their name and there's a problem with that that is why everybody has to reconsider if you you cannot say that oh it doesn't matter no it does because if you remember abraham's name was changed sarah's name was changed uh paul's name was changed from saul right it does matter the name that you answer matters a lot so, my name is Tobe or Tochuku. My name is Tobe Chuku. What I did is to remove that Chuku and then put, it, put Ya. My name still means praise God in the Igbo language. My name means praise God. So, I just put Tobe means praise. Tobe, that is praise. I just put Ya. Because like it says in Second Chronicles 7.14, my people, if my people who are called by my name and we clearly know that we have Isaiah, Jeremiah, Nehemiah, Hezekiah. We, we have all those names. So, again, I say all this, and I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm done pretty much. I say all this to say this. The idea that we don't have to keep the law is absolute nonsense. And if you are not keeping God's law, you are actually going against Christ. I have shown you with the word of Christ where he commanded his followers to keep all the laws of Moses. So there's no way you can say you're following Christ but you don't want to keep the laws of Moses. You are making yourself one of those people that Christ will reject when he comes back. Sorry for speaking too much, for too long. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Tuba. Um, uh, there are people on, on in the line. As, um, Evelyn, do you have anything to say? Sister Evelyn? No. Okay, Sister uh, Sayram. Yes, I would like to say something. That was uh, that was very good. Thank you so much, uh, Brother Tobia. Um, you know, there are a couple of things um, 
you know, even the point you made about the marriage in the church, you know, uh, doing the weddings in the church, you know, they, they even do funeral services in the church and bring the dead body into the church. I can't imagine in temple time that they would bring a dead body into the temple. Whereas the law says you should not, even if you touch a dead body, you'll be unclean for what, uh, I think it's seven days, right? And yeah. It, yeah, so that is completely against what the laws uh, of, of Moses are saying. Uh, so thank you so much for that. And then you also mentioned about the names. I totally agree with you. The names, even the although they've corrupted their names, the um, the original biblical Israelite names are still found in Africa today. They are still very much found in Africa today. And your name even sounds like one of them, like the like the Tobe that you that you have uh, uh, as part of your name. Right. And even you mentioned, um, uh, well, I'll say that the Eve language also has a lot of the uh, of these names as well. And I actually uh, do teachings on them on my YouTube channel and also on H2N TV. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the we cannot live without the wind. Right. We cannot live without the wind. And in in the Eve language, the, the that concept is very clear. Because the word ya, yeah, I know that ya yeah is abbreviation for the tetragrammaton, you have have hey. But ya yeah itself represents just that, our subsistence, which is, it means three things. It means the wind, it means air, and it means the breath of life. And this is in every language. This is a West African Hebraic language. So, yeah, thank you so much for what you've explained. I wish uh, that that aired them. I wish you had put on the replays <laughs> because I would have loved to share this uh, teaching to, with some of my friends. But I hope that you can have uh, Brother Tobe yeah, here again and we'll record it so that we can share it. Thank you. Exactly. Yes. Um, um, I think we have to do that so that at least you can come and teach um, about the names and their meanings, um, how our names are in the Bible, like how everything is, is there for us to see, you know, to know that we are the people. Uh, so I think we'll do that. Um, we will arrange, we'll talk so that I don't know when you'll be free. So that, uh, yeah, anytime that you are free, just let me know so that we can arrange it. Well, the thing now, is that, like I said, I, I, I told you already and I tell everybody, mm -hmm. um, if you, this is priority for me. This is my life. This is what I'm going to do until I, until I die. So you can, I, I'm, I will never tell you, oh, I'm so sorry, I can't make it. The only reason why I will not be able to make, if you invite me to something, the only reason why I will not be able to make it is if I'm already engaged in something that, something similar to this. Like if it's something biblical, if I'm already engaged, I'm speaking somewhere else, then and it, and it happens to conflict with this time or your time that's but if it's like anything personal i will suspend my life i will suspend anything to be there i don't mind i don't i don't care i will you know so i had a i, I had a someone that scheduled something and it was uh, actually 2 a.m my time um and i had to try to be ready for that so um so I, I, my point being that you can schedule it whenever you want to schedule just let me know that it's going to be at this time and i will try to be available um i would like to sister mention about the dead body they're bringing into the church uh yeah according to the law in uh, numbers 19 when you touch a dead body you are unclean for seven days uh when you touch a grave you're unclean for seven days so now they take a dead body and bring inside the church that is what happens but that is even that is that's something but let me let me show you something else that you guys are familiar with that we've been tricked we've been tricked which is wedding wedding do you did you know that we are actually the ones who are doing the wedding you see in the bible 
John chapter 2. Yeah. Wedding, yes. a, wedding at Cana. So our enemies, our enemies were actually holding the Bible. They were not reading it. They were holding it because what they did, what, what they did was that our ancestors, as anybody would have, our ancestors was very protective. Initially, the Europeans didn't come into Africa with sword. They didn't come into Africa buying people. The first thing they did was to send their so-called missionaries. Which, by the way, they still have that today. So something called CIA. They still have CIA. Central Intelligence Agency in America. That is now the modern day missionary missionary that they had in they had back then. You might be wondering, wait a minute, brother. What do you mean that CIA is the modern day missionaries? I'll tell you. Because a lot of these NGOs you see in Africa are CIA ag agencies. If you live in America, you will never, ever in your life see a car with the name CIA. You will never meet any man or woman and he or she will tell you, I'm a CIA agent. You will never see that. Okay? It might be your neighbor. You might, it might be your, your, your nephew, your cousin. They will never tell you. Their job is to do covert missions. Covert. Okay? This guy... Let me give you an example of somebody who has been leaked, linked or leaked to be a CIA agent. You guys know who I'm talking about. Um, this gay guy on CNN, what, what's his name? The gay guy, not the black one, the, the, white, the white one. Very famous. Anderson Cooper. Exactly. That's, yeah, a, that's cool. a CIA yeah, agent. Okay, that's a CIA agent. So they have it in their news medias. They have it in news medias. They have NGOs. They have all kinds of, so that's how they operate. So that was what they did to us. These people were not dumb and stupid. They know if they send, if they send, if they send their military to come into Africa, how many people are going to come? If they come in, we will defeat them. So what they did is to send people that look harmless, people that was wearing white and holding the Bible and called themselves missionary. And they came in. Telling us that Jesus loves us. Okay? So initially, of course, everybody is on guard. When you see these pale people coming in into your town, everybody is on guard. Everybody is on a war mode. But they were telling us that they came in peace. They came. They started asking for the king. We took them. They were taken to the king. And they, so that was how it all started. So what they did was to first disarm us psychologically to present themselves as being harmless because when you look around your village you see this white man walking around wearing white holding a bible carrying his backpack telling you that jesus loves you he came here to tell you that jesus loves you so that basically disarmed us psychologically we no longer we didn't see them as enemy so after they now did this and got us that's when their merchants and their traders now came in that's when they now came in and began to build those railroads that they were building all the way to the sea. And it, doesn't, it didn't occur any of our ancestors. Why would anybody come to your house and be building railroad from your village to the sea? Because they wanted to be taking things out. So the point I'm trying to make is that if you look at what we call a traditional wedding today, traditional wedding, if you, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you can go on YouTube and type in traditional wedding or Igbo traditional wedding, Ebanko. That was exactly the wedding that Christ went to in John uh, 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 chapter 2. The wedding at Cana, where he turned water into wine. That was the wedding that he went to. Now, did you know? Now, let me ask this question. You can, you can answer me because I could be wrong. So I'm going to ask this question. Is a Christian supposed to drink alcohol? I'm asking everybody. To my knowledge, no. Well, I think it depends on I the Christian denomination. I think you can because in Timothy it says that you can no, drink no, a no, no, bit no, 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 not Timothy. No, Chris, uh, Timothy is not a Christian book. Okay, okay. Yeah, Timothy is not a Christian book. Uh, Christianity has nothing to do with the Bible, and I can prove it to you. Christianity has was, nothing uh, to do with well, the Bible. So the, the, the question I'm asking is this very simple question. 
I'm asking based on your knowledge, based on what you were taught. All of us came up as Christians. I'm asking, was it a normal thing for a Christian to drink alcohol? No. So generally, all of us know this. Generally, if you grew up in Africa, you know, Christ if you're a Christian, you're drinking Fanta, you're drinking Coke, you're drinking malt. Normally, Christians don't drink alcohol. That is why if you happen to come from the area where you do traditional wedding that we normally do with pan wine, we will replace it with malt and Fanta. That's how we used to do it, right? That's how people, even till today. So my point is this. This is a very important point. Christianity teaches that we're not supposed to drink alcohol. You're not supposed to do that. And that's one of the things that they will count for you as sin. But did you know that when Christ turned water into wine, did you know that that was an alcohol? It's actually written there in John chapter 2. Yeah. yeah. And I was going to say that too. When I, you know, when I was reading the Bible, I seen that he was known as the wine bearer. He, he came drinking and marrying, and his eyes would be red from drinking wine. That was prophesied. And I was going to say, in Timothy, you have to drink a little bit of wine for, that, for your ailments and for your stomach problems. So now, what if you if you bread for drinking wine, I don't understand that. Can you explain where it says his eyes were red from drinking wine? Okay, uh, that is kind of uh, a prophecy, right? So I'm talking about reality of what he actually did. Just looking at what he actually did when he turned water into wine. That was alcohol. And you might be brother, one, you might be wondering. Brother Tobias, yeah. Can you please give me the reference? I I'm taking notes, so I would like to, you know, go and then look at where it says that Yeshua had red eyes from drinking wine. That's new to me. Yeah, I think where Sister Judy, who, Judith, who said it. So, uh, Sister Judy, do you have the Bible verse so that we can take notes of that? Please. Yes, I'm going to go look for it and find it for you. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's Genesis 49, verse 12. Genesis 49. Verse 12. Verse 12. 49. And, and also, and it's like you said, you can find this one too. He was known as the wine bearer. That's in the Bible as well, too. So, the point that I'm trying to make by bringing up the issue of wine. Because if I tell you, like as I said earlier, that Christianity has nothing to do with the Bible, I can understand why people will get offended because they see it as an attack. So it needs to be proven. When I make a statement, I have to prove it. So I'm, I'm, sure, I'm giving you examples like baptism, how we now baptize babies, but we've been tricked into accepting Western names. They, they, they tricked us using the Bible, but they're not reading from the Bible. So today we baptize babies and we give them Western name, thinking that we're actually following the Bible. First of all, you're not supposed to baptize a baby. One. Two. Um, yeah. you, don't, you don't receive Western name. Western name is not biblical name. So I'm using, the, I'm trying to show you how we've been deceived using the, the Bible is not the problem. I'm, I'm saying this for a reason, because a lot of the things we've been taught, a lot of the stuff we've been taught has nothing to do with the Bible. That's why I'm giving you an example with wine, because generally anybody who grew up in Africa, I don't know about other countries, but we do know that if you're a Christian, you are not supposed to drink alcohol. You're not supposed to go into a beer parlor. You're not supposed to do that. I'm talking about good Christians good Christians do not drink alcohol. And if you ask them why, they will say it's a sin. But then, I'm showing you that Christ turned water into wine in John chapter 2. And that, that wine was alcohol. How do we know that it was an alcohol? Because the Onyuko, the man, we call it Onyuko in my language, the man who was like uh, the, the man in charge of the wedding, right? Ask the question to the man that owned the house, the father of the girl, because wedding is not done in the church. Like as I said before, I said earlier, if you can show me anywhere in the Bible where a wedding was done in the church, send yeah. me your email. I will send you $50. 
The reason why I say $50, because I'm being realistic. I'm not going to tell you $1,000 or $2,000, something that I cannot do. If you can show me anywhere from Genesis to Revelation, where a wedding was being done in the church, send me your email and I will use it to, to use PayPal and send you $50. I know you're not going to find it. But you see how we've been deceived and tricked into doing Western wedding. Okay? So we, that was actually doing the wedding you see in the Bible. How do we know that that was an alcohol? Because if you look at John chapter 2, look at the statement that that man made. After Christ turned water into wine, after he turned water into wine, uh, when, they drink, when they drank that wine, the wine was so sweet. The wine that he turned into, he turned water in, that wine that Christ made was so very sweet. And the, 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 the man in charge of the wedding came to the owner of the house and said, what, what happened? Why did you do this? Normally, people will bring the sweet wine. And when people get drunk, when the guests get drunk, the owner of the house will now bring out the wine that are not sweet. But you, you did the opposite. You gave us the wine that was not sweet. And then now that everybody is drunk, you now brought out this one that was sweet. So he's referring to the one that Christ made. Because the one that Christ made was much sweeter. But they're all alcohol. Because the wine that Christ made was still the same kind of wine that they were drinking earlier. The only difference was that the, only difference was the one was that the one that Christ made was actually uh, much sweeter. And that was palm wine, by the way. Palm wine is the wine that God approved for us to drink. Palm wine is the God-made wine. I do not drink man-made wine. Stop drinking man-made wine. If you keep it drinking it, you will eventually have kidney problems. You're going to have heart, heart disease if, you, if you're drinking man-made wine. Because man-made wine is laden with all kinds of chemicals. That's a fact. Okay? Stop drinking man-made wine. If you want to drink wine, drink palm wine. Palm wine is the one that God made. If you know how palm wine is made, people, somebody will go up to the palm tree, dig a hole on the palm tree and put a pipe and put a gallon. You go there every morning and you bring the wine down. The highest thing that wine will do to you is to make you drunk. And you know that that wine is only good for one day. By the next morning, it's spoiled. It spoils. So palm wine will not harm you. Palm wine is the real wine that our ancestors were drinking. But you notice that we've rejected palm wine because of Christianity. So today, we don't drink palm wine anymore because of Christianity. And then... I have a Brother Tobia, uh, please uh, let me clarify something. I think there's a... I have a question. I have Sister Serum too. Okay. I think there's an issue with that whole uh, doctrine of... Uh, Jesus' eyes being red from wine, um, you know, and, and I think it's because of Bible translation. So that concept is coming from the King James in Genesis 49, 12, where it says, his eyes, his eyes shall be red with wine and his teeth white with milk. But when we look in the, the, the New Living Translation, I think that's the one you hold on to. Uh, it says his eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. And it's the same translation in the NIV. So now we have to, you know, when we see uh, scriptural differences like this in, you know, from translation to translation, we have to, comp we have to look at the life of the person that this is in regards to. This regards to Yesu or Yeshua, or some may call him Jesus. When else have we known him to be so inebriated that his eyes are bright red with, from like a drunkard? No, that is not in the character of him. So then that should tell us which translation is the more accurate one. A one. And it's not that his eyes are red with white. But then the more accurate one would be the description of his eyes that is closer to the color or darker than the color of wine, which is the typical African eyes, which is brown. I yield. And that leads me to my question of the, sim the, the similitude of or the significance of him having the wine at the wedding. So I was going to ask you to kind of go into that um, what was the significance? Okay. So, I never, never, ever quote, I never quote, you know, the verse that talked about his, red, his eyes 
being um, like red as wine. I don't, I don't like to quote that place. No, the it reason wasn't why. you who said it was Sister Judy who said it. So yeah, yeah. that's why I asked. I, I understand. The Bible says, yeah. I understand. Yeah. The reason why I don't I don't quote it. So normally you hear that from you, you normally I, you normally that, Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say I was the one that said that. Um because it said his eye was, was red from um from wine. Because also when he came he was drinking he said he was drinking and they and they called him a wine bibber. So obviously he was drinking. And then also when you read Timothy, it said you should drink a little bit of wine for your ailments and your stomach. And I never knew that until, like you said, Christians, you didn't know that. But I'm like, it says to drink wine for your sickness and your ailments for your stomach. So he did drink wine. Yeah, he will drink wine and a little bit of wine will never turn your eyes red to where it's noticeable. Uh, speaking from a, uh, you know, uh, medical perspective it is when you are actually you have gone overboard that your eyes will be red and now we have to also think about who was calling him the wine the wine bibber we're talking about the hypocrites the yeah, pharisees right so they are the ones my sisters the please ones my sisters like, yeah. sisters please oh, I, I, I would never sorry. i would never had brought up the this particular verse that you guys are discussing and what's happening right now is the reason why I don't bring it up. This yeah, this is mostly I'm quoted. Okay, let me know. Okay. Go ahead, sister. Go ahead. It, it never said he was inebriated. It just said it was wine. It didn't say he was drunk. You know, it didn't say anything like that. It just said his eyes was red. For instance, me, I, I don't. I'm not a drinker at all. So sister, maybe, please let's not let you, you guys let's not argue about whether Christ was because I don't know if you, you guys. This is gonna go to a place that you guys may not. Uh, uh, there's something I'm trying to say, but, you, but I'm yeah, trying. I'm trying to a, say something. If you guys don't uh, mind, uh, brother Tobia, this is a teaching that some of the camps are teaching, and it's really deceiving. that's what that's what I'm trying to say. If you guys will let me, that's what I'm. That's why I don't quote it. That particular, this particular thing only comes from camps. The camps are saying this to say that 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 he was a black man. Then they end up describing Christ as a drunk. But that's not what that place is telling you. Christ was not a drunk. They will say that. Do you know what it means when somebody drinks to the point that their eye is red? They have to be like very drunk. So Christ wasn't walking around drunk. That's why I don't quote that place. I would never have brought it up. You guys brought it up. And th what I, what's happening right now is exactly what happened when you bring that place up. Because it's being misquoted. If you watch these, he, these videos on YouTube, you're going to hear them on their attempt to describe Christ as a black man. They will quote this, that his eyes was was red as wine. They, they will quote this place, but they, it's being misquoted. And it's, be, it's portraying Christ as a drunkard. The Bible never portrayed Christ as a drunkard. Okay, if you want to show the skin color of Christ, there's a better place to go to. And I don't think I've ever had them, I, I hardly, like rarely hear them go to that place. There's a better place that tells you exactly what Christ looks like or what God looks like, what the Most High looks like. They don't go to that place. They go to Revelation, which is a prophecy, by the way. So notice how I went to John chapter 2. Something that is realistic, something that actually happened, and something that is still happening till today because the Igbo people are still doing traditional wedding, wine carrying. So that place that talked about about his eyes and wine, that's more of like, it, it, it's it's almost like a a, 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 a a proverb, right? It's like a proverb. It doesn't mean that he like he sits and drinks until his eyes turns red. Because the camps will tell you, if you watch those videos, the camps will tell you that the reason why his eye was red was because he was drinking wine. So the, if you just drink a little wine, does your eye turn red? No. So that means that you know, for his eyes to become red, he has to be super drunk. And Christ wasn't super drunk. So they don't, I don't think they realize what they're saying. You shouldn't go to that place. You should never, ever, you should never use that place to show the skin color of God. And if you need a place you can go to, tell me and I will show you and I'll prove you to you right now exactly what God looks like. God looks just like you. There's a place you can go to and show it. And I'm telling you, everybody will shut their mouth. Nobody will argue with you when it comes to what God looks like. If you show, They don't read that place in the church. They don't quote it in the church. They don't read it. And it's so interesting that our brothers on the street, also, do you, they don't use that place. There's a better place you can show right now that will show you exactly what God looks like. The skin color of God is in the Bible. 
but they don't go to that place. They go to a place that defame Christ, that portray him as a drunkard. So I would never go to that place and quote it. But anyway, what I was saying, the point I was making, my brothers and sisters, is this. My point is very, very simple. You see that Christianity teaches us that drinking wine is a bad thing. But then you see Christ. Drinking alcohol is a bad thing. But then you see Christ making alcohol. Okay, aren't you supposed to follow Christ? So my point is that Christianity is full of contradiction. Christianity has nothing to do with the Bible. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this for you to begin to think of other things we've been taught in Christianity. Other things we've been taught. I gave you an example with baptism name. Baptismal name. That was their way of imposing their name on us. But you don't see babies being given a name like that. I mean, all these are all the... That, I'm making a bigger picture, a bigger point here. My point is that there are other things we've been taught. When I came into this room today, the brother asked me a question about keeping the law. And Galatians, I went to Romans chapter 7 and broke it down and showed him that Paul was talking about different types of laws. Whenever you see Paul, Paul tells you that we're not under the law. Paul is talking about different types of laws. He wasn't referring to just only the law of God. So when you look at wedding, we are the one, we, your people are the one who are doing the wedding you see in the Bible. There was nobody in the Bible that was doing church wedding. Wedding was never done in the church. But you see, my point being that the enemy, the enemy, the heathen, the Gentiles, who took the Bible in 70 AD, now use it to pretend as if they're following it while you know, instilling their ideologies and their way of life into us in the name of the Bible. So when we actually, and the bigger point is that if you say you follow Christ, if you say you love Christ, then you have to keep the law of Moses. It's right there in Matthew chapter 23 from verse 1 to 3. Sister, you asked the question, what does wine, what's the sig significance of wine in wedding? What is significant of wine? Okay, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 14 from verse 22. Let me show you why we drink wine in the wedding. Deuteronomy. What you're about to read right now is the word of God. And the Most High said this. Deuteronomy chapter 14 from verse 22. Can you give me one second? Let me locate it. Deuteronomy's what? Uh, 14 from verse 22. And this, what the sister is about to read, this is where you see the law about tight. And it's going to tell you the truth about tight. Tight is not monthly. Tight is yearly. Okay. Please don't let us go into tight today, please. No, no, no. Um, uh, this what <laughs> this is going to show why we drink wine. This, this. Stand up, are you running away? No, I'm not running away. But I don't want us to go into tightening because it's a revelation, and um, it's all uh, tightening is about uh revelation, and it's a matter of the heart. If you, okay, so I'm, I'm, not I'm not gonna, I'm not, I'm not gonna. Oh, okay, okay. So, okay, so <laughs> let's do it this way, okay? I'm gonna be respectful. Uh, we're gonna read this because this particular place that she's gonna read talked about different things, but this is also talking about tight, but it also talks about wine. Okay, so let's just focus on the wine part. So go ahead, sister. Okay. Deuteronomy chapter 14 right. from verse 22. Deuteronomy 14 okay. from verse 22. Okay, 14 to 22. Thou shalt truly tithing all the increase of thine seed, and that the field bringeth forth year by year. Keep reading. Uh, yes, please. And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God, in the place which he shall choose to place his name there, the tithe, the tithe of thine corn, of thy wine, of thine oil, thy festivings, thine herds and thy flocks, that, th that thou mayest learn of fear the Lord thy God always. Continue. Yes. And if the way be too long for thee, so that thou art not able to carry it, or if the place 
be far from thee, which the Lord thy God shall choose to eat his name there, then the Lord thy God hath, hath, hath blessed thee. Then thou shalt turn into thee money, and bind up the money in thine hand, and shalt, and shalt go unto the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. And thou shalt bestow the money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, for oxen, for sheep, or for wine, or for strong drink, or for whatsoever thy soul desireth. And thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice, thou and thine household. Continue. Okay, so he said, basically, um, we go to the temple uh, to go celebrate the feast. So sometimes people who live very far away, they can't carry all this food and carry all this produce to travel. So he's saying that they, they, they can sell it. You can sell those produce you're supposed to use for your tithe. Sell it, use the money. When you get to the temple, you now change the money. If you remember Christ over two tables, you have the money changers in the temple. In the temple, the reason why you have those money changers, right? The reason why you had them was because you have people coming from all over the world. Like for example, in Acts chapter eight, Acts chapter eight, you have the Ethiopian eunuch, the Ethiopian eunuch that came from Ethiopia to pray in Jerusalem. And then you look at John chapter seven, John chapter seven from verse one. You see the brother of Christ, his brothers asking him, are you not going to go to the upcoming feast? Are you not going to go to the feast? And then he told them to go, that he's not, he's not going to, his time has not come. And then you see uh, Acts, Acts 18, 21. Acts chapter 18, verse 21. Paul was not in Jerusalem. But when the feast day is coming up, Paul was hurrying up to get back to Jerusalem to keep the upcoming feast. Acts 18, 21. This was after Christ died and left. So the point being that here you see in Deuteronomy chapter, chapter 14 from verse 22, that the Most High was telling our people, when the, when the time for the feast comes, if you happen to live very far away and you cannot carry all this stuff, because you're supposed to carry all this produce, your tithe, and carry your wine too. Carry your wine. But you have to understand that there are Israelites that live very far away. Their house is very far away from the temple. For whatever reason, they lived in a different land. The Most High is giving this law here. Saying that if if, you, if if the place you live is too far, you're not going to carry all this stuff getting into a boat. So you can arrange all that stuff, sell it, take the money. When you now get to Jerusalem, you can change the money and then rebuy all this stuff. You need to rebuy them. Now, you, when you rebuy them, also remember to include strong wine, strong drink. Now, what is strong drink? Because there's a difference between drink and strong drink. There's a reason why it has strong. Strong drink is not just a wine. The reason why you see the word strong is because it's alcohol. Alcohol is what makes it strong. So, saying that you could, uh, you know, buy strong drink and celebrate with your family your wives and your children and your servant, because that, those feast days are a time of celebration. So here you clearly see the Most High telling people when you come to this feast, because feast is from the word festival, festival. So we have festival, and you know that festival is a, festival is not mourning. Festival is celebration. That's where the word feast came from. So during this feast, we celebrate. The only feast that we do not celebrate is the Day of Atonement. We fast. We don't celebrate on that feast. We fast. But the rest of the feast, we celebrate. It's like a whole one week of party. One week of party. Drinking, dancing, praising the Most High, studying. So here you see the Most High, including strong drink as part of that celebration. So when you, a man is giving out his daughter in marriage, it's also a time of celebration. That is why in the Igbo culture, Whenever, if you are giving your daughter a marriage, 
if you're giving your daughter if you're giving your daughter out in marriage as you see in Sirach 725 Sirach that's one of the things that we say in our culture we don't say these things anymore today actually if you say it today you you can be cancelled by the council culture if you say that a man gave away his daughter or should give away his daughter the idea of giving away your daughter we don't use the, those kind of language anymore but our ancestors used to use it even when i was growing up so that the idea of giving away your daughter or getting a wife for your son because that is what we're supposed to do you see all this stuff that we're doing today did you know that do you know that a a a, a hebrew a hebrew boy or man is not supposed to get his own wife his parents are supposed to get a wife for him that's why when our ancestor was going into captivity into babylon when our ancestor was going into captivity what did the most high tell them he says you are going to be there for 70 years when you get there get wives for your sons and give your daughters a marriage just like you see in Sirach 725 and just like you see in genesis chapter 24 genesis 24 before abraham died abraham made sure to get a wife for isaac abraham handled everything abraham abraham paid the bride price abraham did everything so the way we do marriage today is the opposite of how our ancestors did it both recently our ancestors our recent ancestors and our ancient ancestors the israelite the way we do marriage today is different from the way they did it they did it biblically so it is your responsibility as a father or mother to get a wife for your son it's your responsibility to give your to give your daughter a marriage because we didn't do boyfriend and girlfriend boyfriend and girlfriend is something recent that we started doing we learned from the hidden we're not supposed to do boyfriend and girlfriend we're not supposed to do that a boy is not supposed to have sex with any girl that he did not marry. You can only have sex with a woman that you marry. A girl cannot, is not supposed to lose her virginity until her wedding night. As a matter of fact, the Mosai said in Deuteronomy chapter 22 that if a girl lose her virginity, if a girl lose her virginity before her wedding night, she's supposed to be put to death. So that's why you see that it says in Matthew, Matthew chapter 1, that uh Joseph wanted to quietly put Mary away because Joseph understood that he's supposed to marry a virgin. So everything we're doing today is the opposite. And I'm fighting on this particular angle. I'm fighting, trying to teach our young people. Teach boys, stay away. Don't have sex. Don't bother girls. Do not bother girls. Because sometimes we focus on teaching girls. Keep your virginity. Keep your virginity. But we don't teach the boys to not bother the girls. So if you come into a neighborhood where you're teaching the girls, dress moderately, keep your virginity, do this, do this, but you don't teach the boys, the boys will still go out and be bothering the girls. So we're supposed to teach them properly. That is what I'm trying to do now. I teach them properly. You, you're not supposed to have sex with any girl that you do not marry. So if you go to Judges chapter 14, Judges chapter 14, you see that when Samson saw the woman that he wanted to marry, Judges 14 from verse 1 to 3. Judges 14. When Samson saw the girl that he wanted to marry, Samson did not go and start talking to her and try to like sleep with her. No. The Bible tells you in Judges 14 that Samson went back to his own parents. Samson went to his own parents and said to his parents, Mother, father, go marry her for me. I saw a girl that I want to marry. Go marry her for me. Because Samson cannot go and marry that girl. This is why in the Igbo culture, if you want to marry a girl and you go by yourself, the parents will ask you, the parents of that girl will ask you, where's your people? Where are your people? Because if you want to marry a girl and you go by yourself, you're not serious. It's like you have some kind of mental problem. You're not serious. If you want to marry a girl, you're supposed to come with your people. You're supposed to come with your mom, your dad, your relatives. If you want to marry a girl that's the way it was done in the, in the bible biblically that's the way it was done we don't do it anymore we're following the europeans somebody can meet somebody in vegas on a weekend they go through a drive through and they do wedding six months later they're divorced so today we are now following the europeans that's why we are now doing baby mamas and baby daddies which is an abomination in the sight of the most high that's an abomination in the sight of god 
So, but our, the system that the Most High gave us was far more superior, much, much better. All these things we're doing, we have to repent from these things. We're not going to see his kingdom doing this way. We have to let go of all these ways of the Gentiles. So I'm telling you that the way we do wedding today is not the same way that our ancestors was doing it. Our ancestors did it the way the Most High wants us to do it. Today, we do church wedding. A man is wearing a tuxedo. The woman is wearing a wedding gown. And we go and do it in the church. But the principle of wedding, we are not following. The principle, there are principles that God put in place that you have to follow. Like as I said, in our culture, both biblical and in the Igbo culture, your son cannot just go and get a girl. Before your son can marry any girl, you, the mother and the father, has to approve it. If you don't approve it and they go against you, they go against you, they're going against God. And this is one of the things I teach young people. I have an online school where I teach our people, teaching young people the right way. I teach them, if you go against your mom or your dad, you are 100% going against the Most High. If your mom or your dad asks you to do something and you go against that, you're going against God. So this is how we have to educate them because this is true. If you look at the laws that the Most High gave to the kids, okay, you're supposed to honor your mother and your father. And, you know, so... The, the the keep that in mind that as hebrews it is the mother and the father that gets a wife for their son it is the mother and the father that gives their daughter a marriage a way in marriage um and the age will shock you we're not going to go there right now we're not going to go into the age unless if somebody asks that question specifically then i will go there because i, I don't want to create distraction i want to keep it to to your questions so the age will shock you that's a whole different topic. And I think I do have some videos on that. But we could, we could deal with that. Because why are we even talking about these things? Why are we even gathering like this? We gather today because the Most High wants us to gather. Okay? We gather today because your Heavenly Father wants you to be here right now. What am I talking about? Because the Most High was angry at His people. Because of their sins, their wickedness, their lawlessness, their stiff-neckedness. The Most High rejected His people and scattered them in the four corners of the earth. And then the Most High released the prophecy in Deuteronomy chapter 30 that said that in the later days, in the later days, if the descendant of the ancient Israel, if they come back to their senses and they realize that they have gone against the Most High and they decide to come back to the Most High, then He will begin to open their eyes. He will gather us. That is what, what's going on right now. So we're here because the Mosai is gathering us. And one of the things you're going to see in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 1 to 7, is that the requirement that God has for us is that we have to go back to the commandment. And some of these commandments, if you go back and keep them, people will say you're crazy. People will say you've joined a cult. People will say you've lost your mind. People will accuse you of all kinds of, all kinds of accusation. So... There are some practices that, some things that our ancestors practiced that will never be accepted today. The problem we have is that the Most High still requires us to do these things. So we can either separate from the world and focus on rebuilding our relationship with our Heavenly Father by following His Word, or we can try to keep one foot in the world and one foot in the Bible. And what I do see today is that a lot of people, a lot of our people like the idea that we're Israelite. They love that idea. All their life, they have been searching. They didn't become comfortable. They were uncomfortable with the idea that they were black or they were African. They didn't like that. It wasn't enough. So they were searching for something. And through searching for something, people end up in Jehovah's Witness. They end up in Pentecostal. They end up in Nation of Islam. Through searching. We're searching our identity because we lost it, right? But some people also will come across the idea that we're Hebrew Israelite. They love that idea. And most people will just stop. They stop at the door. The door is just knowing that you are an Israelite. That's just the beginning. When you find out that you are the descendant of the ancient Israelite, you're just at the door. You're going to have to come through the door and come in. So coming in means you're going to have to begin to change your life. You cannot say that you are an Israelite, but you don't dress like Israelite. You can't say you're an Israelite, but you don't eat like Israelite. Today we eat three times a day. Did you know we're not supposed to eat three times a day? Did you know that? Our ancestors did not eat three times a day. 
and eating three times a day is making us fat. Did you know that we're not supposed to be fat? Did you know that in, in Deuteronomy chapter 32, the Most High was disgusted because our ancestors became fat? Did you know that? Deuteronomy chapter 32, the Most High was speaking about how we became fat. He doesn't like that because what happens? You see, the Most High deals with us like a father would deal with the children. He wants the best for us. What happens when you become fat? You now are at a risk of developing diabetes. I met a man earlier today who is blind. He became blind, blind five years ago. And he told me it was as a result of diabetes that he became blind five years ago and he most likely will never see again. Diabetes will lead to all kinds of problems. Being fat can lead to all kinds of problems. It can lead to stroke because order, your arteries are all blocked. The point I'm trying to make is that if we say we are Hebrews, that's good. If we say we're Israelite, that's good. But we actually have to repent. We actually have to go back to these laws. Mm -hmm. We actually have to begin to keep these laws. It's not just enough to say that we're people of the Most High. We actually have to begin to learn them and begin to observe them. And honestly, my brothers and sisters, God's law is not difficult to keep. It's not difficult. If you look at the questions that have been asked today and the answers I gave you, I'm showing you not just with my word. Talk is cheap. Talk is easy. Proving what you say is another whole thing. I'm proving to you that when Paul tells you, I prove to you with Romans chapter 7. Anybody can go and read Romans chapter 7. When Paul tells you that you're not under the law, Paul was not talking about God's law. Paul was talking about the law of sin. And I showed you what the law of sin with Genesis chapter 4 verse 7. I showed you what the law of sin is. So, my brothers and sisters, the general point is that we've been lied to. First of all, you are the Israelite. Second of all, we have to go back to the law. That law is our law. That is our book. That We should take delight in that book, like Paul tells you in Romans chapter 7, that he delights in the law of God. Romans chapter 7, 22. He delights in the law of God. So we shouldn't be questioning or like being, listen, that law, the law of God is good and we can keep it. And if we don't keep God's law, the Most High will not deal with us. The only reason why he will deal with us or accept us is if we go back to the law. That is the only solution. Uh, okay, uh, I think Sister Asterium wants to say something. Asterium, do you want to say something? Oh, no. Uh, I was just cheering him on. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I was just cheering him on. But yeah, great job, uh, Brother Tobeya. Uh, thank you so much for all that you've expounded upon. Yeah, bless you immensely. I will say this. Um, the majority of the original Israelites are within Africa. And I'm sure you know that it's not only the Igbos, as I know that it's not only the Ezes. We have so many uh, ethnic groups within Africa, especially West and Central Africa, and you have some in Eastern and Southern Africa as well. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, I'm not yeah. saying, are you, do you know about the Limbas? You know about the Limbas? I agree with you. You know about the yeah. Limbas? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. they're, they're then, Israelite too, so we're scattered all over. I agree with that 100%. Right, right, it's not just exactly. the Eagles. Yeah. And then our brothers and sisters are in Amer in the Americas, in the Caribbean, uh, in uh, Europe, and in Asia. So truly, we are scattered all over the world. So, And of those things that you've described in the marriage process, I can guarantee you that we also do it in Ghana, Togo, and Benin as well. And I'm sure you will hear it from other uh, ethnic groups even beyond those uh, areas. So thank you so much. Yeah, bless you so much. I have to go because I have to go to another room. But this has been so enjoyable. Thank you. Now, isn't it sad? Isn't it sad that we've been deceived into rejecting this truly biblical marriage system and now replace it with a white wedding? So, I mean, it's sad. But uh, anyway, our solution, our, our only hope is to go back to God's law. You see, once we go back to God's law, we will restore all of these things. It will be restored, you know. So I've already started restoring it, restoring it in my own life. I'm not going to wait for the whole everybody to wake up. I'm already restoring these laws in my own house, in my own life. That's it. Well, that's what all of Paul said in Philippians 2.12. Walk out your own salvation with fear and trembling. 
so that uh, told me uh, it sounds like some of us that did not do white wedding but did the traditional wedding it's okay yeah it, okay? it's 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 okay but there's something a little there's something behind that um because again i mean we could go into it but i want to make sure i wrap this one up sister Lurus, you asked what's the, your question was what is the significance of wine in wedding that's why i showed you deuteronomy chapter 14 from verse 2 uh, from verse 22 to show that wine is a big part of our celebration so when we do uh, when we give our daughter a marriage uh, we also that's that's how wine came into the part of came in there of course we now make the father the father will take a wine and give to the daughter the daughter and the daughter will take the wine right i'm giving Mother you Tovia, that that really does it doesn't it just shows that it's done in other cultures or that it was done it's not really ex from that, my that, understanding that, that, that's really what explaining I, that, it to me that's what I'm, I'm i'm giving you the second reason first um, okay, I, yeah. I gave you Deuteronomy chapter 14 from verse 22 to show you that the Most High told us to drink strong wine during our, like our very important feast festival, during time of self celebration, to drink strong wine. So what I was going to give you now is the second reason why we drink wine in wedding. Second reason why the significant. And when you go to YouTube, you're going to see it when you go to YouTube and type in traditional wedding or Igbo traditional wedding so one of the if you've ever if you ever if you have ever been to that wedding or if you have ever watched a video on youtube at some point you're going to see the father father of the girl who will, 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 will take wine and give to the daughter the daughter will take that wine and start looking for the husband when she gets to the husband she will get on her knees she will get on her two knee on her legs on her knees and she would take, she would give that wine to her husband, and then her husband would drink it. So that signifies something. When you go to Numbers, uh, Numbers chapter thirty, that talked about vow. When a girl is in her father's house, she is under her father's authority. When when she, when when a man marries her, she is now under her husband's authority. So that wine that her father would give her, that she would now carry. It's like her father is authorizing her to her father is now giving her to her husband that wine is like like if you let's say i come to your house and i'm thirsty and you go get me a glass of water there's a way we also describe it you i can say can you please serve me a glass of water so when you go and get a glass of water and hand over to me i have served you a glass of water if you come to my house and you're thirsty and I go and get a glass of water and I give you, I have served you. I served you a glass of water. That is why some people in restaurants are called servers. Servers. Those people that bring that food to you, they are the servers, right? So when, when we do that traditional wedding, that wedding that you see, in the wedding that Christ went to, when a father gives that wine to the girl, it signifies something. It means something. When she takes that wine and go to her husband, she will get on her knee. She will not be standing up. She will be on her knees in front of her husband, in front of everybody in public, and she will give that wine to her husband. It signifies that she's willing to serve her husband. And she's willing to submit to her husband. That is what it signifies. Signifi signifies sorry. That's what it signifies. That's what it means. It represents something. And as soon as her husband drink that wine, people will clap. Okay, so wine is a very, very uh, big part of our wedding, as you can see in John chapter two. Um, unfortunately, we've replaced that wedding with white wedding, European wedding, which has not been used to, you know. So I also bride prize. I didn't mention bride prize. Bride prize. We also do that. Uh, if you're from Ghana, if you're from uh, from Nigeria, or I don't, I hate, I hate calling it Nigeria. I don't like to call call Nigeria. Liberians used to do it as well. Oh, okay. So, Liberia. so that you, you don't see Chinese doing bride prize. You don't see white people doing bride prize. White people go to their drive through and do their wedding. Go to the church and do their wedding. They don't do paid bride prize, but we pay bride prize. 
just like you see in Genesis 24. Genesis 24, a bride price was paid for Rebecca to her mother and her brother. And then you go uh, into the uh, Exodus chapter 22, 16 and 17, the Most High talked about bride price. So that is something that we don't just do the one thing. We also pay a bride price. So in our culture, there are two things you do. We have two wedding, two two things. You pay a bride price, and then you the 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 the, the ceremony. The ceremony is when we drink the wine. That's optional. You are not required that you must do, do the ceremony. You don't have to do the ceremony. So, for example, there was no ceremony between uh, when when Isaac married married um, Rebecca. All they did was to pay a bride price. That, that's it. That's all they did. It's just to pay a bride price. We don't do marriage license. And as a Hebrew, you should never go get a marriage license. You should never do that. You should never. And teach your children not to do that. Because as soon as you get a marriage license, you're not getting... First of all, you're taking permission. That's an equivalent of Israelite taking permission from Canaanite in order to get married. So we should never ever get marriage license, first of all. Uh, because our ancestors didn't do that. What you do is that if you want to marry somebody, you go to the family, you talk to them. If they choose to give you their daughter, then you pay a bride price. You can, for example, there was no, uh, well, there's kind of like a ceremony with Jacob and Leah and Rachel and the other uh, uh, the other l l ladies that he married. But it was the major thing that he did was the, the major thing that he did was the, uh, the, the bride price. As soon as he paid the bride price, that's it. That's, that's it. So another aspect of this, and this is for you, Sister Evelyn. Another aspect, which I do have videos on this, on my YouTube channel, is virginity. Virginity. Virginity is a big aspect of Hebrew marriage. Virginity. The most high, that blood that comes out when a woman loses her virginity. I know, I know, before I even say this, before I even say this, let me put a disclaimer, because I know that some, somebody might tell me, well, brother, not every woman bleed. Every woman does not bleed when they lose their virginity. Some women will lose their, some women will break their hymen when they are climbing trees. I know, I know that they are, sister, and could you make... school activities like high jump and other things. Yeah, so I do know that there are some women that may not bleed, but we know that normally normally just like we know that there are some men who cannot grow beard but we do know that normally men have beard so i'm speaking generally women do bleed okay i'm telling you that that blood that comes out when she loses her virginity oh my goodness you will be amazed what that blood means that blood means something and i can show you from the scripture what it means the most High sp spoke about that so blood that comes out of her when she loses her virginity is a big part of that wedding. So first of all, let's start with covenant. When a man marries a when a man marries a woman, there's a covenant between them. There's a uh, covenant. Toby, um, Toby, I have a question about um getting papers for marriage. I thought that you had to get the papers because it says like in Matthews, if you want to divorce, you got to serve her with um papers of divorce divorcement. No. So I thought you had to like, you know, if they had to serve a paper of divorcement, I thought you needed like papers to get married to have official papers. No, in Matthew 5, 30, uh, 31 and 32, it wasn't talking about Christ was referring to what our ancestors started doing during the time of Moses. So during the time of Moses, people decided to start writing bill of divorce. That is why Christ said that Moses allowed you to do that for the because of the stiffness of stiffness of your of your the stiffness of your heart. That was why Moses permitted you. But in the beginning, it was not so. The Most High never permitted us to write a bill of divorce because, first of all, the Most High does not allow divorce. The Most High made it very clear, and we can go to those laws. The Most High made it very clear: once you marry a woman, you can never divorce her. Even Paul tells you that. So uh, if, it, if it's possible, if, we, if you guys can help me out so that we, I can be giving you this scripture and we can be reading it, reading it real quick, okay? Paul tells you no divorce whatsoever. Even Paul tells you that in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians 7, um, 
verse 10 and 11, and also verse 39, Paul tells you, okay, no divorce. So why, why is there no divorce? Because even the what you call the New Testament, I'm not going to go too deep into the part of the New Testament because there's nothing like the New Testament. There is nothing like the New We're not under the New Testament. I know they say we are, but I can prove to you that we're not. First of all, real quick, Jeremiah 31, 31. Jeremiah 31, 31. What did the Most High say? The Most High said that under the new covenant, he will put his laws in our heart and everybody will know him from the least to the greatest and nobody will ever be taught to know the most high everybody will know the most high now let me ask you guys a question real quick, quick question just real real fast does everybody right now does all the people of the most high do they all know him no okay no no. Yeah, you, you can't tell no. me that all of our people know the Most High because when no. the when, when the Bible says to know the Most High, you do realize that the Bible gave you the definition of knowing the Most High. That's in First John chapter two, verse three to seven. By this we know that we know Him, if we keep His commandment. He that claims to know Him, but does not keep His commandment, is a liar. So when the Bible when, when the Bible when the Most High say that, when the Most High say that. Under the new covenant, this is Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31 from verse 31. So please get a pen. I think you should write these places down so that when we're done, you should go back and read these places. Like as I said, if you come across anything that was saying something that, that was different from what I'm quoting, come here next time and expose me. If I give, I'm going to be giving you references. I'm going to be giving you historical references Biblical references, when, when I make a claim, I give you a place that, that, that shows that, that supports what I'm claiming. So that is how I speak. I don't just talk. I will just give you the evidence. So one of the lies, and I'm going to get back to the marriage thing. I'm going to get back to the marriage. One of the lies we've been taught is that we are under the New Testament. Testament is covenant. That is a lie. We are not under the New Covenant. The idea that we are under the new covenant is a big blow to us as a nation. That's an insult because Israelites are under God's punishment right now for breaking the first, that covenant. And the Most High gave you, uh, uh, he gave you a sign how to know when you are under the new covenant. The Most High said in Jeremiah chapter 31 from verse 31 that when he makes the new covenant, right? Everybody will know him. But like the word sin, sin, 1 John 3, 4, sin means breaking God's law. Today, Christians will tell you that if you drink alcohol, you're committing sin. If you do certain things, you know, according to them, you're committing sin. But we can't just pick and choose what is sin. Why can't we pick and choose? Because the Bible have already told you what sin is. It's found in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. 1 John 3, 4. Sin is the breaking of the law. Transgression of the law is sin. So just like the Bible gave you definition of sin, the Bible also gave you definition of knowing God. By this we know that we know him. If we keep his commandment, he that said claim to know him but does not keep his commandment is a liar. So that is what it means to know God. 1 John chapter 2. From verse 3 to 7. That is how uh, you know that you know him by keeping his commandment. Okay. So we are not under the, under the new covenant. Because if God said in Jeremiah chapter 31 from verse 31. That when we are under the new covenant. Everybody will know him. Right now most of us in the world. Most of us in the world. Most of, most of us are not even keeping God's law. So that means that we don't know him. So the idea that we are under the new covenant. Is that, like as I explained to you earlier, when the Roman Empire invaded Jerusalem in 70 AD, they killed a lot of Hebrew Israelites. They killed a lot of them. The ones that escaped Jerusalem and migrated into Africa, they left. They were running for their life. So that was when the Roman Empire took over the Bible, the, the scrolls in the temple, the menorah, and all the other stuff in the temple. They took over these things. So they now... As technology improved and writing skills improved, that's how they translated the Bible 
and they made the Bible more compact to the point that today you can carry it on your pocket, you can have it on your phone. Back then, Bible was huge because these are big scrolls. Scroll. That's how the Bible was. So the Gentiles took over the Bible in 70 AD and the Mosai allowed them to do it as you see in Lamentation chapter 2. Lamentation chapter 2. From verse 1 to 6, the Most High allowed our land to be invaded. The Most High allowed them to take over, allow the heathen to, to take over and destroy Jerusalem. The Most High allowed them. So they now took the scrolls and then translated it. And then they went and gathered the writings of Paul. Galatians, Romans, Titus, Timothy. They gathered these books and put it next to the laws and the prophet. And then they now put the, the thing, New Covenant, in there. New Covenant, New Covenant, New Covenant. So that's where New Testament, they put the word New Testament. That is where this whole idea came from. But if you actually look at what God tells you, if you look at what God tells you will happen when you're under, under a New Covenant, that thing is not happening right now. Unless you can tell me that everybody knows God and everybody is keeping God's law. God tells you in Jeremiah 31 from verse 31 that under the new covenant, he will put his laws inside our hearts and everybody will be keeping it. Everybody is not keeping God's law. Most men will wake up today, go in front of their mirror and shave their beard, eat pork or shrimp as breakfast and spend the rest of their day breaking God's law. Most of us are doing that today. So we're not under the new covenant. Now, if we go back to the marriage thing, uh, blood that comes out of a woman when she loses her virginity is a very big part of that marriage between that man and that man. So you can go to Malachi chapter 2. Malachi 2, you see where the Most High talked about this, about that covenant. Malachi chapter 2, the Most High mentioned the covenant that I'm talking about right now. So there's a covenant that happens between a man and a woman. Um, Malachi chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. Malachi chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. Can somebody please read it? So I'm explaining to you that when it comes to marriage, virginity has a lot to do with biblical marriage. And God, it was his will initially, even till today that a girl keep that virginity and that blood that comes out has to do with that covenant. So I, I want to show you that covenant that the Mosai talked about. In Malachi chapter 2, verse 13 and 14, he spoke about that covenant. You can read it later if you want to. So if you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 22, you see even more significant part. I don't know. I really, I would love for someone to read it. If I, if I read it, it might seem like you know, I'm, I'm, I would like to have this come from somebody else's mouth, from their own Bible. That's why I prefer so, for someone else to read. Just so, you know, it, it, we have like a second witness. So if somebody can please read uh, Malachi chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. First, I want to show you about the covenant between a man and a woman. And then we go to Deuteronomy chapter 22. From verse 13. So again, remember what we're talking about. The way we do wedding today is nothing close to the way our ancestors used to do it and the way that God wants us, to, wants us to do it. Today we're doing it according to the Gentiles, according to the Europeans, and that's not right. What was the verse again? Malachi chapter 2. 13 and 14. Malachi 2, 13 and 14. Yes. And that thing you do, you flood the Lord altar with tears, you weep and wail because he is no longer looked with favor on your offerings or accept them with pleasure from your hands. You ask why 
it is because the Lord is the witness between you and the wife of your youth. You have been unfaithful to her. Though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. That's it. Okay, this is the Most High speaking to men. The people that the oh. Most High was speaking to here is 100% men. These are the Levites. And in the past, the Most High stopped answering their prayers. And these men will go inside the temple. They will go inside the temple and they will be shedding tears. They will be crying and crying and crying because they did not understand why the Most High all of a sudden stopped answering their prayers. So now the Most High was revealing to them, the reason why I stopped answering your prayers is because I, I saw what you're doing to your wife. I witnessed what you were doing to your wife. Even though there's a covenant between you and her. So that was why the Most High stopped answering their prayers. Now, the translation that you read said partner. That's not actually partner because the Most High did not give a woman to a man to be partner. So that's like the translation, the Bible translator kind of put that, that in there. But mm -hmm. a wife is not like your wife is not your partner. No, a woman, your husband is not your partner. It's not partnership. It's not 50 50. So the idea that marriage is 50 50 or partnership, that's a Western ideology. And that's why part of the reason why most of the marriages end in divorce. It's not supposed to be a partner. What does he say in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 8 and 9? 1 Corinthians 11, 8 and 9. The man was not made for the woman, but the woman was made for the man. Now, I want you to watch that word very closely. Made. The man was not made for the woman, but the woman was made for the man. A lot of people don't know this, but actually, the reason why the Most High created Eve, the Most High created Adam for the Most High, for Adam to serve the Most High. The Most High created Adam for Adam to serve him, at least right at that time in the garden. But the Most High noticed that Adam needed some help, someone to, 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 to serve him. So it was the job of the Eve to serve Adam while Adam is serving the Most High. I know in 2022, that sounds like a misogyny, as they would say. But let me show it to you in Proverbs 31. I'm going to show it to you in action. Proverbs 31. Notice that in Proverbs 31, it talks about a virtuous woman, a righteous woman in Proverbs 31, a very famous chapter. So in that Proverbs 31, it describes the hardworking woman, but she was working in the house. She was working in the house. Her husband was one of the elders. So her husband was serving the Most High with the other elders. And his wife is in the house serving him. You see, the Most High don't want Adam to come back from serving him from the garden. And have to now go and start cooking and start looking for, because it takes time to do these things. It takes at least two hours to cook a good meal. Of course, today we don't we, we eat fast food. We drive through within three minutes, they give us a, something they call food, which is junk. We eat. But to cook a real food takes at least two hours. So the point is that uh, I, I do advise people never ever use one translation. There are some Hebrew Israelite camps that will tell you it's King James only. You can only read King James. They only read King James. That is dumb. That's not right. Because there are some problems with King James. I can show you some mistranslations. Mistranslations in King James. Places that are poorly translated. That is why you have the new King James. They corrected some of the mistakes that they made in King James, the, the original King James. So, and also the reason why some camps promote King James is because they say he's a black man. No, King James was not a black man. 
That's one of the doctrines that people are pushing. So because, because he's a black man, so we now, because he's a black man, we can't read any other translation. We only read King James Bible. Okay. We only read King James. Did you know that right now, there are people who don't eat chicken because of King James? Leviticus 11.20 was, was a mistranslation. It wasn't really like a, it was more like, it was probably poorly translated. So if you read that Leviticus chapter 11.20, Leviticus 11.20, Leviticus if you read that, you're going to have to stop eating chicken. But there's nothing wrong with chicken. But there are people who don't, there are videos on YouTube right now. There are videos on YouTube made by Hebrew Israelites telling you not to eat chicken because of Leviticus chapter 11 verse 20. And that's just one of the places I can show you that has a problem in KJV. So my advice is never ever read only one translation. Always have at least, at least two translations. I read King James. I have King James on my phone. I read King James, but not only King James. When you're doing study, read from this translation and that translation. My recommendation is KJV and, New, and NLT. NLT. King James Version and New Living Translation. That's my recommendation. But never, ever use only one translation. So like you see in what the sister read, it says partnership. So marriage is not partnership. It's none of that. Marriage is a man serving the Most High and the woman serving the man. That's it. That's, that's what it is. That's the way it was set up to be. Today, unfortunately, men are no longer serving the Most High. And that is why, that is why, and I tell men, I, I say this, if you do not submit to the Most High, obey the Most High, and serve the Most High, a woman will not submit to you, obey you, or serve you. You cannot reap where you do not sow. So the Most High is not playing because the Most High has a requirement for us as Hebrews. Our Heavenly Father has a requirement is found in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12 and 13. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 10, Deuteronomy 10, 12 and 13. You see the requirement that God has for all the men of Israel. Our The requirement that God has for us, the Messiah has for us, is for us to serve Him, to love Him, to serve Him, to walk in His ways. So, it's not enough to say that I'm a Hebrew man. I have to actually serve the Most High. I have to serve the Most High. So how do I serve Him? Uh, keeping His commandment is not serving Him. Keeping His commandment is obeying Him. That's one of the requirements. But we're also required to serve Him. The apostles served Him. The prophets served Him. So you have to help to open the eyes of your people. You have to help. And that's a requirement that the Most High have, have on the on the gave the hebrew men of course you do have you do have uh, hebrew women behind the scene like you see in romans romans chapter 16 romans chapter 16 you see paul the apostle thanking the women that was behind the scene helping them out so the men were in the forefront serving the most high but behind the scene there were women who were helping them to make it make it work and that's why the Most High created the woman. So a man can serve the Most High without a woman. But a man will serve the Most High much better if there's a woman behind the scene. Helping, you know, behind the scene. So the Most High today, like as you can see in uh, Ecclesiasticus or Sirach 26-23, Sirach 26, 23, say that a wicked woman is given to a lawless man, but a pious wife is given to the man that fear the most high. So today, men complain a lot that women no longer submit. Women are unsubmissive. If you are familiar with Clubhouse, I'm very sure you've seen all, this, all those rooms talking about submission, 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 submission. Yeah, the reason why that women don't submit anymore is because we, the men, are no longer submitting to the Most High. So, in order for a woman to submit to you the way the Most High set, set the whole thing up, we, me as a man, 
I'm supposed to submit to the will of the Most High. I'm supposed to serve the Most High. I'm supposed to walk in His ways. So, in turn, the Most High will now give you a woman that will do the same. Everything will be flowing. Then you can serve the Most High more efficiently. So, because a, a man that serves the Most High and he doesn't have a wife, he's going to have to come back and cook, wash his clothes, do all this stuff. That's a time that he could have been using to rest, to sleep well, so that tomorrow he will be able to have more energy. So that's why you go to Titus chapter uh, chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, right? From verse 3. It tells you how to raise your daughters. Teach them how to cook, how to clean, how to love their husband, how to be a good wife, how to be a homemaker. Titus chapter 2 from verse 3. We don't do that anymore. Today we send them to school. They go to school. They get that degree. They graduate. They get a job. They start their career. By the time they're in their late 20s, and early 30s, they've built up their career, but now they want kids. At that point, it's much, much harder to find a husband. And speaking of finding a husband, like as I was saying before, blood has a lot to do with marriage. I'm saying this because of the question that Sister Evelyn asked. Just uh, having your bride price paid is not enough. Just going to church and doing wedding is not enough. The Most High talked about biblical marriage. I think I'm going to show you to you and then I will stop so that somebody else can speak or ask a question. Um, I think we've gone past our time. So um, we can leave some for next week, uh, Saturday and Sunday, so that we don't uh, waste people's time because we have really passed. Our, usually we, are, we should, should have ended at 9 or latest by 9.30, but now it's past 10. And I don't want to waste people's time because people, some people will go to work tomorrow morning. And um, yeah, let's uh, wrap it up in five more minutes. Uh, if anybody have any uh, question to ask, so that we close the room, please. Thank you. Uh, Brother Makaya, uh, 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 do you have anything to say? Do you have any question or... Brother McCart is on mute. Yeah. Okay. Does anyone else have anything to say before uh, we, uh, we wrap up the room? We, yeah. Does anyone else have any question? for brother uh, Tobiah, so that, I mean, not too long, so that we close up the room, yeah. It's getting too late. I think what you said was uh, understandable because people have job tomorrow morning, so we can make it next week. Exactly, yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, thank you, brother Tobiah. Thank you so much for all the information. And... Um, I hope next week we can fit, we can uh, continue where we left off. Uh, I'll call you and uh, uh, make an appointment with you uh, if that is okay with you. So uh, next week we can finish it up because tomorrow I don't want to uh, keep people up too late. Um, okay. Is that okay with you, Brother Tobiah? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, God okay. willing. Yeah, next week. Absolutely. That's fine. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Okay, uh, can we just uh, share a short prayer? Uh, can one person pray for us so that we can close and then um, close the room? So, for, I would say, uh, just at, at, for against next week, you can read Deuteronomy mm -hmm. chapter 22, between now and then. Uh, so, because it does talk about biblical marriage and stuff, which is different from the way we do it today. You told me 32? No, 22. 22. 22. Yes. Okay. All of it, right? Uh, mainly from verse 13, verse 13 to 21, and then towards the end. But you can read the whole thing. You can really read the whole chapter. Okay. Mm. Okay. Thank you so much, Brother Tobiah. Thank you.
Thank you for your interest in this video. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact us through WhatsApp. You can call us or send us a message. You can also email us at lawstogod at gmail.com. Check out our website at www.lawstogodskingdom.com. Download our mobile app from the Android store. Search for Laws to God app. You can also find us on Facebook. Just search for Laws to God. Don't forget, you can also use Skype to call us. Just download Skype on your phone and search for Laws to God. If you are in South Africa and you need a congregation to worship with, give us a call. For more information that we don't have here on YouTube, please download our app and check out our website www.lawstogodskingdom.com. Help us spread this truth by sharing this video on your social media.